Hey everyone, I have great news for you today. I have just watched the newest H Bomber Guy video on plagiarism, and midway through the video, he talks about doing a follow up to his previous video, the OOF video, and more specifically, I assume he's talking about Tommy himself, which is great news. So maybe he'll have a new video in the near future in which he un uncovers even more hilarious lies. So I went to a lot of the web pages or the YouTube channels of the people that uh, the H Bomber Guy covered in his newest plagiarism video. And I'm seeing a lot of comments of people making jokes about those people stealing from Tommy Tallarico. So a lot of people are still into the Tommy stuff. So I've decided, hey, it'd be a good idea to maybe create an omnibus of all my previous H Bomber Guy videos where I had gone over through all the comments and put them all together into this one giant video. And it's always fun going back and seeing the stories and the comments of people's past experiences with Tommy. So I thought, hey, let's make one giant video of that. So. Here it goes. I'm just going to stitch them all together and hopefully you enjoy it. So we'll start off first with the this long one and I'll read I'll read the the full comments just because some people don't want to watch the screen and just want to listen to the video. And this one is from uh, a random user who says, "I can't believe I have a story to tell on an H Bomber guy video, but here it goes." The short version of the story is I unknowingly performed in a video game's live concert and along with the entire rest of the orchestra never got paid for it. The time is January 2015, and the place is Oberlin College in Ohio. The college has a music conservatory, and I was dating a classical trombonist getting his degree from the conservatory. I was a sophomore majoring in art history at the college, but I also played the cello for fun. January at Oberlin is called winter term, and it's a month in which students are free to undertake short-term creative or academic projects before the spring semester begins. My then boyfriend alerted me to a winter term project that a classical conducting major at the conservatory was doing, putting together an orchestral performance of video game soundtrack music. The conductor was accepting volunteers from the college and conservatory to join the, his orchestra. No and no auditioning required. We both joined, believing it would be a fun chance to play music together and pass the time during the coldest month of the year. The rehearsals were clunky because many of us were more skilled than the others and plenty of us were not taking the process seriously. But, but this didn't really trouble me. After all, I was under the impression throughout the rehearsal period that this was simply a conducting student's creative and fun idea for gaining more practical experience conducting an ensemble. And that the performance at the end of the month would be just like any other the countless free concerts that take place at the Oberlin campus year round. Fast forward to the day of the performance. To my surprise, we took a bus out of the town to a neighboring city, Lorraine. It's not a big city, so I didn't expect much. We were ushered into a performing arts auditorium, which seemed far too big of a venue for such a humble, ragtag band of college musicians. There appeared to be professional lighting, and we were fitted with an apparatus I'd never used before, tiny electronic earpieces, which would help us keep time during the performance. I was already feeling confused and uneasy when the audience started to pour into the auditorium and fill seemingly every seat. I, really, I realized the concert was not a low-key affair whatsoever and that each audience member had likely paid for tickets. How much, I had wondered. As the concert began, a charismatic and energetic man, that must be Tommy, that I had never seen before introduced himself to the audience and hyped them up. I remember thinking he seemed a little slimy, a little used car salesman -y, but I brushed it off. Only during this time on stage did I realize that the performance was part of a tour called Video Games Live, and it seemed like a well-established event. Stage lights flashed and video footage of the various video games played on the screen behind us to accompany each song. I felt, I felt completely out of my depth during the whole performance, but the audience didn't seem to care about our imperfect playing. They were having the time of their lives. After the performance, I felt strange and somewhat embarrassed for reasons I couldn't understand. My then-boyfriend, on the other hand, was furious. He felt like he had been misled about the scale of the project and ought to have been, ought to have been paid for being part of the orchestra. At the time... I thought he was overreacting and needing to lighten up a bit. Within the first few days of the spring semester, life was back to normal and we had put both the bizarre experience behind us. In retrospect, I fully agree with how he felt. We gave hours of rehearsal time over a month with no understanding of what we were actually involved in. Instead of receiving any payment for our time and efforts, whoever organized the concert series was free to make rake in all the cash, all the money and it from the expensive tickets that were for the sold out event. Our willingness to make music together for fun was seemingly exploited to provide entertainment for a paying audience. And to be clear, the lack of compensation is one problem, but the lack of clarity about what we were rehearsing for is an even bigger problem in my eyes. It's possible that I might have missed something along the way, and if so, I take responsibility for not being 
more observant, but I feel confident of enough about what I remember to share it here as such. My recollections and experience. Now that I have watched this expose on Tommy Tallorico, who I previously knew nothing about, but who very well may have been the same man who introduced us on stage all those years ago, though I cannot remember for certain, in his propensity to pathologically lie, to take credit for work he, he did not do, and to choose showmanship above anything else, that strange month of my life makes infinitely more sense. So an interesting story here. And Video Games Live always advertise that they use local symphonies or orchestras and all that, but they never, well, I guess they wouldn't advertise it, but it is kind of slimy that they kind of, they tricked people into doing this instead of making it clear. I would think that they would have a contract or something like when people signed off saying you're doing this on a volunteer basis because some of the music and some of the, the shows I know are recorded and used for promotional material or he even sells the live shows on back in the day on CD and DVDs. So a bit slimy. This one's from DM Gaina. He says, I worked with the Amico and had several calls with Tommy during the process of developing games. Overall, yeah, a lot of it went horribly wrong with the system and marketing. Hell, our prototype console was a bunch of random components in a cardboard box. I am not making this up. We had cables attached to a cardboard box under a PC monitor. But it was a real passion project for Tommy, and he always was 100% behind it. He felt like that Tommy wanted this thing to succeed and be a fun console for absolutely everyone. I still have a lot of insight in the projects in the system. If you're curious, just ask me anything about it. For legal reasons, I cannot disclose which projects or companies I have worked with. Toxic has said, I'm so curious about this, but I don't even know where to start specifically. I, like, I expected it to be probably old tech-wise, the way he was waxing nostalgic about it. It felt almost like he was trying to barely update a SNES or Atari style console. The controller on the pitch video in the that brick shape and that boxy design of that console in the all in the same room just gave me a gaming of the 70s, 80s vibe. But components in a box is hilariously awful. I don't even know what to say. Like, was it ever functional in any way? Did this box even turn on? Like, I have a box of parts. It won't do uh I didn't click read more, so I don't know what else it says. He was always super nostalgic about it and basically wanted to have others relive his gaming childhood moments. Like SNES, NES were never part of any topics. It was either in television gaming of the past or in general gaming in the past. He was strictly against online play with other people. However, he wanted to have an online leaderboard and a physical achievement system to recreate a similar feeling to Nintendo Power where you can submit a high score and get a price in return. So he dreamed about having certificates sent out to players small goodies, which is indeed a cute idea, but a logistical problem. And for some reason, I did not click, click, click read more. So I don't have the rest of that comment to read off. But the basics of it is, it seems like Tommy was stuck in the past. Marshall wrote, I actually went to the guy's house when I was a kid. Ironically, sometime in 2012 or 2013. Because my mom's boyfriend at the time was one of Tommy's executives. And it was so surreal watching the, this H-Bomber guy's video featuring the rooms I had been in like nine years ago. I had completely forgotten about his and his house's existence. And I never thought I'd see someone I vaguely remember in my childhood appearing in one of my favorite YouTubers' videos. Thanks, Henry. And the follow-up comments have Marshall saying, and by executive, I mean he just organized stuff for the video games live concerts. That guy in the corner had said, man, just seeing photos from inside my friend's house or convention centers I've been to is wild. To me, that sounds whack. I like the, the lingo. It's whack. Marshall responds with, yeah, and something that Henry didn't really touch on, probably because there's not much record of people caring, is the fact that the house is just ridiculously dusty. I had really annoying allergies as a kid, and being there for two or three hours that I was there killed me. Looking back, it made me realize that half the stuff he bought was probably to make it seem like he cared deeply about the nerdy stuff he did for his job, when in actuality he bought it only because he could. He also says, by the way, I just watched the video on a second time through my with my mom, and she brought up a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know. She was around Tommy and Video Games Live crew a lot more than I was. Apparently, the Miyamoto stuff might actually be somewhat true, as my mom recalled meeting one of the Mario devs who was hanging out with Tommy in the backstage of Comic Con 2013, or in Video Game or in Dubai when Video Games Live was doing one of their shows there. I don't remember which locations she said. So that comment, uh, we'll go back to the the house the. We've seen how dusty and dirty is. One of his tour videos where he goes through his kitchen, I, I remember because they had like a some type of fossil or dinosaur thing or something. He lifted up and then, and you could see like the the counter looked like it was white, but it was actually red. It just had so much dust and all his little knickknacks. I can only imagine 
a nightmare of how much it would take to clean up that house. And we know that he does have animals in his house, or he did. Maybe not anymore. We'll we'll find out about that, I guess, down the road. But it's a really dirty house. And I don't doubt that he had people from Nintendo hanging out with him because he did work with Nintendo. So Miyamoto, though, on the other hand, uh, doubt. Noah Waters says, I had friends who played for Video Games Live. Touring shows with symphonic music tend to hire local, usually university students, as the classical instrument players while the touring group consists of the core rhythm section and sound crew. I can remember clearly I was rather glad I didn't take the gig because they didn't want to pay and only after some badass threatened to involve the union did the checks rapidly appear. So there there you go. Another person saying that they would go on tour and just try to get free help. You would think they'd pay, even if it's not much. Just something for someone's time. F Jardim 14 says, I worked as a press I worked as press and covered a video games live concert in Brazil 2009. Brief, briefly met Talarico backstage. Now I didn't see him use any illegal substances, but he was certainly wired. Guessing he's hinting that he was on the cocaine. And his neck was so taut I can hear the tendons creaking. He could not shut up about wanting to be taken to a brothel the minute the shows was out. The venue manager later told me that they had secret rule to never leave anyone alone with them, especially women. I was in my big I'm a gamer phase back then, and it was a colossal letdown. Well, those are some strong uh, accusations, and he had edited the post, so he definitely went over it, so he meant what this uh, person wrote. Now, we can't. <laughs> this is all speculation, so we have no idea if this is true or not. There has been some mentionings of Tommy fancying the, the younger ladies, but who knows? But uh, another another very damning story, if true. Chicken Ring, New York City, says, One of the orchestras I sometimes played with presented video games live a few years ago with Tommy. I'm a lifelong gamer, but never heard of the guy. As an orchestral musician, I've played many of these prepackaged Pops concerts. They're almost always fun because they're low pressure, easy, and we put them together on one or two rehearsals and bang them out. I'm certain we were half drunk for this one, and of course we had a good time because video game music has a lot of percussion, but damn, I saw through Tommy instantly a total poser, self-aggrandizing nobody. I was just glad to take his money. So there you go. So somebody had a good time doing the concert, and they were paid. Twilight Waker of Time says, This was so wild. When I was 17, I played harp for video games live with a local orchestra. I met Tommy Tallarico and he was pretty nice since I showed up to a concert in a Zelda cosplay and was a kid. At the time I wanted to go I wanted to get into the gaming industry with music and he promised he would hook me up with some people to get me involved. He never answered my email. I'm starting to think maybe that was for the best. He also didn't even pretend to be sorry for for, for forgetting me when I reintroduced myself after playing in video games live again four years later. I didn't care, but my friends were offended on my behalf, lol. Fungers says, I worked in the video game industry a few years ago, including the video games live, with video games live. My contact, you can guess who, was a whore to work with. They were extraordinarily rude, entitled, incompetent, and couldn't care less about their customers. They would frequently make mistakes and critical information, and then come back furious and blaming us for doing exactly what they had instructed, because they forgot what promises they had sold, and their customers pointed it out. To make it worse, this work we did to deliver on their promises was for free because a biz dev guy said we would. The polar opposite of this was the Grim Dawn folks. They were extremely thankful, gracious, and kind. At one point, they said something like, The thing that we care most about is that our customers are maximally happy. Clam Errol Pearson says, I once played violin in the orchestra for a video games live concert. The conductor was a good guy from what I remember. From the few interactions I had with Tommy, he seemed only interested in self uh, aggrandizement, hopefully I said that right, fan service and spectacle. He never expressed any actual artistic interest in the music we were playing. Knowing all about him years later makes it an even weirder experience to look back on. It was still a fun concert. The Hail theme rocked. This one's from Court Jester. Wow, really impressed all around. I met Tommy and knew him a number of times as Video Games Live began taking off. I was, and am still, part of a gaming news site and recall him reaching out to us personally in an effort of correcting something or other. Eventually our group was extended invitations to attend Video Games Live Chicago as VIP with backstage access etc. What wasn't said until after everyone traveled across the US and arrived to the theater was that he expected anyone attending with comp tickets to work for free, shilling things in the lobby, setting up, cleaning up etc. 
Afterwards, the guy bragging of his Ferrari in his mansion in the same breath asks these same guests, unpaid workers, to taxi him around because, and that's where you would insert a flimsy excuse inside there. He also skipped out on any of the bill later that night when we all went out to eat. A few years later, attending either E3 or GDC, he invited us to cover the Gang Awards and attend their related festivities. About 10 awards in, I was suspicious enough from an obvious pattern of winners' nominees to do a bit of legwork from the audience and essentially discovered what was revealed in this video. These were awards being received by the same people handing them out. A great big phony industry circle jerk. Bit like buying oneself a birthday present. At least I did get introduced to some wonderful other people and a few personal heroes through it all. Not by Tommy, just merely through attending. Not saying he doesn't have talent, he's clearly gifted musically, but it seems he's also clearly a grifter of sorts. I don't know about the gifted mu musically, but that first part of that comment, where he expected everyone to help him out for free, sounds awfully familiar of our uh, Amico coverage of the Crayola event. I wonder how Retrobro feels. It seems like Retrobro got suckered in like this guy did. So this one's from at Dowd Alzair. I met Talrico when I sang in a local choir for a video games live concert. I didn't directly interact with him, but he radiated cringe. A specific incident I remember is that we were rehearsing Baba Yetu from Civilization, which was in Swahili. The music director was trying to get us to sing with a different kind of tone, and Talrico yelled, Sing it like you got a bone in your nose! The music director ignored him and kept talking, so he repeated himself louder. Nobody laughed, a fact which seemed to surprise him. Ah, that's that sounds like a type of Talarico humor being completely oblivious to uh, the race, the racial connotation of what he just said. I believe this story. Okay, this one's from Tommy T. Wait a minute, Tommy T seven five five five. I don't know about that name. Not that it matters, but I thought I'd share. I played for video games live back in 2016, 2017. It was a fun time. Tommy came to the final couple of rehearsals and took the time to talk to any of us who wanted to, which I really appreciated as a musician, where most of the headliner talent runs off the stage as soon as we, as their obligations are done. I told him how much fun the parts he arranged were for my instrument, and he, we chatted a bit about Halo and how formative its soundtrack had been for both of us. We also talked about Nine Inch Nails' Quake soundtrack and how important it was to appreciate the compositional limitations of older software and how we can learn from and incorporate those ideas into current video game music. But anyways, I got a super cool I got super good vibes from the guy and never would ever imagine all of this. In retrospect, I see that him being the big name celebrity chatting with the local musicians was probably a major perk of the gig. He gets to be the big successful guru that all of us small potatoes want to chat with. He struck me as a someone who was a real sucker for the limelight. And who could blame him? He really enjoyed himself putting on those shows and I had a great time. Shame about all that I've learned tonight. So there we go. I had someone with a positive experience with Tommy. This one's an interesting one. This one's from Scott Barrett IHQ, who I believe was the developer of Bomb Squad. He's popped up in some YouTube comments in the past, and it's kind of, uh, he said some things that are positive about Tommy, but he's also has made it quite aware that the Amico was not functioning properly, and that's why there was input lag and the difficulties they had developing for the console. So let's see what he writes here. So Scott says, well, that was a tour de force, a real spectacular breakdown, a really fascinating examination of someone who I've known for a long time. I'm not here to refute or confirm anything, but I can say this. I was in the room when the oof was recorded. Doubt. That's me saying doubt. It was, he didn't say doubt. I, I, I like how these people remember the, the sound effect of how oof was recorded. It's just a, a one of the thousands of sound effects used in the game. Why is this one so special? It's just, it's not, there's nothing, it's just a, a hit, like someone getting contacted. Like, the, I'm pretty sure the guy who designs Madden's sound effects doesn't remember, oh yeah, Madden 2002, when somebody gets tackled by the, on their legs. Uh, I finally remember that moment. Like, people, I don't know. Let's just read what he says. I, I have serious doubt that he was there. I wrote the intro animation for Messiah and was directing the six-year-old girl who voiced Bob. I was collecting really just for the intro, but was aware that any hit sound could be used anywhere in the game. I had written Oof and Ow as an indicator that she should do a series of hit sounds. Being six, she read it literally, and everyone in the room had a laugh when she did. I Facebook messaged with her dad recently, and she's aware of the Oof popularity, and I don't think she wants her identity exposed, so I won't do that here. 
My recollection of this sound recording session is that Tommy was there, myself, the girl, and her dad, and I'm sorry I can't recall if Joey was in the room. As well, there was another shiny guy and his father who played God for the piece. Tommy or possibly Joey set the mic for her, set a level, and hit record, and probably to dat. I assume the recording in its entirety was sent to Joey who would have set an EQ, compression, and maybe a bit of a down pitch to make her more male sounding, and then chopped it in bits for me to lay into the intro sequence. I realized I'm not providing much more information, but that's all it was. Well, apparently he worked on the game, so maybe he was around, but once again, how... A game from so many years ago that at the time nobody, you're not going to remember a random sound like this. This sounds, I, I don't believe this. That's just my opinion. And some other people wrote that still generally interesting and I'm glad she knows about the sound though I totally get why she doesn't want to be publicly put her name on it. And Ram, Ram Papia, are you doing a Talarico here? So I'm not the only one who doesn't uh, buy this story. Scott responds, some people in her circle know about it, but I gather. But yeah, it would be weird suddenly having fans for something like this. It was a pretty funny recording session, honestly. Trying to get your typical injury sounds was definitely tough with her. Something with adults doing this kind of sound effect. There's some physical contact like mild stomach punching from someone in the room to elicit or inspire the oofs. Of course, none of us can do that to a six-year-old, so I remember she took it upon herself to try to unsuccessfully punch herself to get her those sounds out, but ended up just looking adorable like a kitten with a slow and threatening squat. So we only got the literal oof spoken and we all thought it was funny and moved on to other dialogue. Fun fact for me, I have no idea I was listening to the credits for that sound effects library until seeing this video. So this guy is saying that the kid punched herself in the stomach to make the oof sound. This this reeks of uh, Talarico fabrication. I, it's just my personal opinion. Write in the comments of this if you... if I Maybe I'm just somebody who, can, who can't believe anything. And maybe it is believable. Just you let me know. And uh, he also writes, it sounds like that. I do apologize. I could get someone from Guinness to confirm. I posted that Messiah video 12 years ago and actually bought, I mean, one a Guinness record for the least views received on a video that's been posted for 12 years. And then that record for the guy who understands the YouTube algorithm for popularity. Proud moments. Oh, yeah. Some comedy from Scott. Uh, yeah, as I said, I don't, I don't buy this. So this one is Radiant Cucumber, nice name. This is so weird, I've actually met Tommy Tallarico. Fan Expo 2005 in Toronto, he gave a talk on making game music, though I remember him mostly talking about doing the music for Earthworm Jim and Advent Rise. I think he means Rising. I hadn't heard of him before, but and since this was a convention, I wanted his signature. So I asked him to sign a Diglett Pokemon card I had in my pocket. I remember he remarked to the bimbo he was with, Look at this, they have me signing Pokemon cards now. I think I still have it too, LMAO. <laughs> Pokemon cards, that's that's funny. I can see him saying that. I believe this story. This one's from Marvelism. I have a Tommy Tallarico story, probably around about 12 or so years ago, back when I went with a friend to a video game collecting expo in eastern Pennsylvania. It was a fun little thing with lots of sellers, tables, back when you didn't need to take out a personal loan to buy retro video games. Free arcade with a bunch of old machines and a couple of special guests. One of them was... You guessed it, Trolley Esposito. Guess he means uh, Tommy Tallarico and not Tony Esposito, classic hockey player. We walked past the table he was sitting at and noted that he looked a little bit sad. Perhaps the multi-award winning re world record holder had lost some weight recently and so people didn't recognize him. Our eyes met ever so briefly and being the reserved Englishman I am, I gave him a quick, yeah all right, nod and moved on. So about 10 minutes later, we're looking through old cartridges and I glance over and I realize that Tommy is looking at the seller's wares also. We thought little of it and moved on. A few minutes later, my friend nudged me as, again, Tommy was close to us again looking at the same stuff as us. Then it happened a third time. Our, our joke was always that he had seen us and was feeling lonely and had to start to follow us. Had started to follow us. Now that I know what a weird, insecure, lying weirdo this guy is, I do wonder now if... That little y'all right nod I gave him was one of the few human interactions that day. Maybe he was following me in the hopes of getting another sweet little piece of recognition. Perhaps my accidental shunning of him set him off on this dark path towards scamming people with a game console nobody should want. A way to go, Marvelism. It's your fault because the Amico, all because he didn't follow through with the y'all. Y'all right. So this one from my Vicky Ill says it wasn't until an hour in that I remembered. I went to a video games live concert in Indianapolis during Gen Con. 
The host pulled a young woman up on the stage and harassed her. The audience booed, and after holding the microphone away so we couldn't hear, he told the audience, she's legal. Guess after confirming her age, no holds barred. The early 2000s sure did happen. Well, there goes another story of inappropriate behavior. Zio Magir says, One of my formulative youth memories was the day Video Games Live performed on stage in Sweden. I had been looking forward to the concert for almost an entire year. I sat way too close and had to wear earplugs to not lose my hearing. But I nevertheless had the time of my life. Remarkably, one piece of the concert that stood out to me ever since, at the very end, when Tommy held the closing speech thanking everyone involved, I learned that the concert user... I learned that the concert used a local orchestra for the performance. A local orchestra Tommy tried but failed to remember the name as he told us to give us a round of applause for them. Now I think I know why. And that's just hinting that they use free local help. Studio Gallifrey Music says, Before I start watching this, I just want to speak about my personal experience. I met Tommy Tallarico at Video Games Live a few years back at the last ever show he was doing in my city. I've been to Video Games Live a few times, and every time he came to my city, he seemed... Always seemed like a genuine guy that just loved video games and wanted to spread that love around the world. Then I guess he started working with the television, or bought it, I don't know. It all seemed to go down from there. I saw the news about the Roblox sound semi-recently, and to be honest, I didn't even know there was a battle going on. Really disappointing. Oh good god, it's so much worse than I thought. So somebody had a good experience with him, so not all negative with uh, Tommy. The Rising Sunfish says... Oh, I, and he's saying this to Emissary of Wind. Oh, I remember exactly. I was watching the video, the first video games live concert they recorded for TV and feeling neutral to positive towards the MC until he showboated himself into a literal spotlight for One Winged Angel, flailing around on his guitar like a midlife crisis Marty McFly saving his parents' school dance. Like, bub, you've done nothing but ride your earthworm gym cloud for the last 20 years. Get off the stage and show some damn respect to an actual talented composer. So another person who's not a fan of Tommy... Flying around the screen, air guitaring. Gabriel Raposo says, Something funny that I have to add up. I went to a video games live on 2012, Rio de Janeiro, in which they held a smash free for all competition on stage while the band was playing the Brawl theme. However, the game was just. The game that was played was Melee, and according to him, it was the actual good one in the series. Very on brand on how people felt at the time about Brawl. So hearing that he gave Melee a 2.5 is just way too funny. That's what he gave on Electric Playground. He gave Smash Brothers Melee a 2.5. Also, you can see an amateur recording of this show on YouTube with the name Smash Bros. Video Games Live 2012 Rio de Janeiro. During the time, a friend of mine said, It's a shame they used pre-recording for the Brawl theme. And I was like, what? They did? I didn't pay attention at it at the time. But now that I know all the stuff about him rewatching the recordings, I can't help but think, were the shows even real too? LMAO. Rotally Pumpard says, I saw a video games live show in 2009 and briefly talked to Tommy at the siding, signing table afterwards. When I mentioned Earthworm Jim, he playfully interjected, mimicking the game's groovy voice clip. At the time, I wasn't sure if it was him implying he was the original voice. He wasn't. It was Doug Tenapel. But I'm pretty sure he would have said if I had asked. So he, he really liked his Earthworm Jim yelling groovy, even back in 2009. So Chronoplague6767 says, I met Tommy at the 2014 Salt Lake Comic Con. He had a panel on the history of video game music, and it was very insightful. He ran out of time and invited anyone who wanted to keep talking to hang out for a bit. He was pretty cool in that environment. However, he does give off those Butch Hartman vibes. Orion Cooper says, I actually saw video games live when it was performed here in my town years ago. It was very okay, nothing really to be excited about, but not terrible. The live orchestra played a lot of classic video game music, going from the prime, primitive, like Pong sound effects to World of Warcraft. I honestly wouldn't have gone, but some friends of mine wanted to check it out, so I went with them. I remember Tommy, or at least the guy I am pretty sure was Tommy, really hamming it up on the electric guitar for their cover of One Winged Angel to the point that I laughed. Note, he was not going for the laugh. <laughs> that is definitely Tommy, and we've seen the videos of him really hamming it up. The only other thing I remember was that they had some interactive games that members of the audience were brought up on stage to play through some sort of physical interaction, like someone played Frogger by moving back and forth on a pad or something and jumped to jump forward. And I think they had Space Invaders or something. The setup looked cool with the game being projected on a massive screen above them, but the interactive part just did not work well and it was just an embarrassment. But this was 2007, so maybe it got better. So that's that, that sounds like a typical 
video games live show. A lot of Tommy hamming it up and some weird other stuff, but for the most part, I think most people enjoyed the music. Hyper Sapien says, I've been to the video game live show twice and enjoyed it. By far the worst part of the show is when the whole orchestra and choir was playing, then the lights dim. A spotlight turns on and Tommy walked out on stage playing some butt rock on electric guitar. Like it was some climatic moment we were all waiting for. It reeked of ego. Yep, that sounds that sounds more right. Lady Sapphira says, I actually saw Tommy at Video Games Live in Ireland. He tried to do a jump on stage and fell badly. He stayed down for a good minute or two before continuing with the concert. <laughs> I wish I could see that video. That would be funny. Shrigma Female writes, I went to one of his concerts in West Texas a couple years ago. It was like a really high budget shit post. And the first time they played the guitar, it let out a deafening screech because they set up the audio equipment wrong. LOL. Well, they didn't have a good experience there. From what I understood, the earlier shows were well done. And just the ones from the last 10 years, I guess, have been terrible. The ones that Tommy has ran. Cool Man Madden says, meet this Tommy guy. Met this Tommy guy, I guess. Met this Tommy guy once when I was working on a local news spotlight for a Video Games Live show in my area. At that time, he seemed interesting, to say at least. The show was kind of dope with or without him being the MC. Had a whole section just for Earthworm Jim with him playing on the guitar. It's just cool hearing professional musicians play iconic VG OST. So he, he mostly liked it. Vertibel writes, I actually went to what must have been one of the first video game live performances way back in 2005. It was right around Halloween and everyone was dressed up and it was a great time. But I distinctly remember the one criticism my friends and I had was, man, that host was annoying. Quint J.E. says, I just had a blast from the past. Ten years ago, I went to a Video Games Live's concert in Amsterdam, and your clip at one hour in gave me a feeling of deja vu. That clip wasn't from Amsterdam. I don't remember him saying that, but I'm pretty sure he was there. He asked us to take a photo and post it under his Facebook post to have a chance to win a prize. Damn, that's kind of really weird to remember. Slime Privilege writes, I was dragged to a Video Game Live's in 2010 or 11, and Tommy came off incredibly obnoxious during it. The funny thing is he kept bringing up the factoid during the show that Bruce Springsteen was his cousin. I kid you not, he must have brought it up at least five times as a recurring thing in between sets. And in this vid, I saw something about Steven Tyler was also his cousin. Guess we can probably chalk both of these up into the lie pile? I'm guessing he is misremembering because I don't think uh, Tommy has ever said Bruce Springsteen was his cousin. He's always talked about Steven Tyler, but sounds about right. Jack Badger. 3976 says, I've been to video game lives twice when it's been in London. I remember saying to a friend that I'm not used to hearing orchestral music over a PA. I'm wondering now if any of that music was performed actually live. That's a good point. I know the original ones were definitely live, but who knows about the, the ones that are more recent. The Average Glasses says, I can't believe this is the same guy who scammed us out of $80, 80 bucks for video game music in concert a few years back. Knew the name and general obnoxiousness seemed familiar. Funnily enough, we left the concert after 10 minutes because the sounds was absolute shite. So finding out he used to be responsible for music just makes this worse. Command Burr says, I just I saw this video game's live concert thing once many years ago and remember finding the loud, arrogant host incredibly annoying and unlikable. Turns out he is way, way worse than I had reason to believe. I also found it very weird that I found it really weird that a lot of the music the orchestra played was classic video game music from Zelda and Final Fantasy, but then Tommy joined in with his guitar, playing basic power chords, and all the songs were obscure Earthworm Jim songs. Well, now I know why. I also remember that he made really rude and aggressive comments about people who are against video games, trying to create a weird us, the capital G gamers against the moment. It was embarrassing to say at the least. And that's, that is definitely, I believe this one 100%, because Tommy used to talk like that all the time, and when say it was us against them but then the funny part is with the miko he crapped on the us people and saying that gamers hide in the bedroom and that everything is violent and gross and he wants it to be all safe and great so the guy definitely has changed his tune over the years or else with the miko he was just full out lying so a few people are familiar with uh, tommy and his time on electric playground with victor lucas and here's a few of the comments Metal King Slime says, Oh good, I thought the guest appearance in Boku no Natsuyami was the extent of H-Bomber guy we'd get for this year. I primarily remember Talrico as the Earthworm Jim guy and the guy who kept talking about how much he loved to feel a controller rumbling up against his dick on G4. 
edit. A lot has changed about my perception of Tallarico in the last hour. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right with Tommy there. Family friendly, I guess uh, the intelligent people could have played those clips of him talking about the rumbling against his dong. His dingling, as he would call it. Omastar444 says, It is sad. The main reason I remember Tommy Tallarico is mostly because of on Electric Playground. I think it, it might have been Judgment Day. He would often pull game controllers and other things out of his pants to review them. I remember it just being weird even back then. So another person talking about how Tommy resorted to the dong jokes all the time. Or else just being a weirdo. Clayton Andres says, I only remember Tommy from one Electric Playground episode where I saw every time they mentioned We Love Katamari, he kept saying, We hate Katamari! Like it would get more funny the more he said it. Anyway, glad to know that there's more going on with this guy. Jerk Hater 20 says, Oh shit, I remember this guy. He annoyed the shit out of me as a teen watching G4 TV because how much he absolutely hated Nintendo and would always give low scores to Nintendo games on that review show. Like I distinctly remember one time when they were doing the pros and cons of GameCube game, he listed it's on the GameCube as a con and docked the points for that. Dude fucking hated Nintendo, had no problem being open about it while reviewing games. And that's the funny thing, because you always complain about Nintendo and talk down upon it, especially during... the Especially after he was let go of Metroid Prime. Hmm, I wonder if that's a coincidence. So for years, he really hated Nintendo and slammed the GameCube and anything Nintendo did. But uh, once Intelligen came back, he always talked about his dear friendship, his dear friend Shigi Miyamoto. So the guy's just a phony. Platformer Masta says, You can tell Tommy Tallarico was closely involved with the production of Tony Hawk Pro Skater by how consistently he gets the title wrong. Which is funny, because if you do watch his interviews, he calls it different things all the time. Xanokill says, As a child, I loved Electric Playground, as it was the only video game review show that I knew of. Even at the age of 13, listening to Tommy review games was a miserable experience. And that's the same experience I had. I wasn't 13 years old, I was a bit older, but... Uh, my memory is because Electric Playground would, was played constantly in Canada, because every Canadian station had to have a certain amount of content created within Canada, so... EP was on so much, especially late at night, during the the times that the time slots that they just need to fill with anything. And Tommy was annoying as hell. He just he 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 was a miserable experience. He tried too hard. He was I, I said this a million times before. He's the screech from like Saved by the Bell. He just tried so hard. RX Dash seventy eight says there's an extra dimension to the Smash Brothers review. Around that time, EP was sponsored by the major console manufacturers. There would sometimes be little segments dedicated to certain games like the Tekken Tag Tournament Move of the Week or the Halo Secret of the Week, etc. There was also a review section exclusively for handheld games, which meant GBA since there was no other handhelds. Now, I don't know the exact order in which these events occurred, but they did occur in fairly rapid sequence. Smash Brothers Melee and Pikmin got scathingly low reviews. Nintendo stopped sponsoring the show. Handheld reviews stopped entirely. Nintendo starts advertising on the show again. It didn't necessarily happen in that order, but the picture it paints is largely the same either way. EP also uploaded old episodes to their review channel, but did not include the episodes with the Melee review. I'm amazed each bummer guy found the footage. Well, that footage has been circulated before, mostly because a lot of people remember Tommy for giving Smash Brothers a terrible review, and a couple of other Nintendo games, so the Nintendo fanboys have hated Tommy for, for 10 plus years. Robinson Knox says, that was pretty cathartic. For someone who watched Tallarico a lot on Electric Playground, Judgment Day, Reviews on the Run, video game criticism wasn't good back then, at least from what I knew of it. But his takes were always so bad, he used to use his dumbass humor to hide how shallow and incurious his opinions were. But I guess that was just the era it was from. There were some reviewers from other shows at the time that had the same kind of dismissive quality. I understand that people are like that in the world, but maybe they shouldn't be professional reviewers. For Tallarico serves at the your example of that kind of critic. I'm so thankful for modern video game criticism, which is deep, human, and insightful. I remember distinctly in that the Advent Rising review they did on the show, Tallarico responsible for the audio in the game, and a real obsessive about footsteps as, uh, sound effects in video games, mentions the bevy of footstep sounds in the game, so maybe he actually did that. He wouldn't brag about something so specific unless he had a part in it, would he? By the way, fantastic video, Catlow. So there we go, That's a, that might be something someone can look into. Maybe all he did was the footsteps within the game. Or Joey Curris did the footsteps and he <laughs> took credit for it. X Best Station says, Speaking of Aladdin, I thought it was also interesting to mention that this is another game most people don't realize 
and the other person had a big hand in with the music creation. Donald S. Griffin is also credited as working on the game's soundtrack, and has went on record saying he composed five original tracks for the game, and he arranged all of the score from the movie. This is interesting to me because in a making of video for the game that can be found on YouTube, Tommy's the only one shown during the music segment of the video and can be seen playing the melody to Prince Ali, a song he apparently did not arrange for the game. That's a really interesting comment because in the Slopes Game Room interview with Tommy, Tommy takes full credit for doing the full audio of the game. And now I know, I think a few other people had already debunked this, and not to mention that most of the audio was from the movie just being translated into the game. But based on this comment, it seems like he didn't even do that and that somebody else did all the, the legwork. So another, another great example of Tommy taking credit for other people's work. The next one from Maria number 94 says, This video was a hell of a trip. It's unbelievable how much stuff there was. One additional tidbit of, regarding EP, reviews on the run, Judgment Day, etc. is that while there were reviews where he would, wouldn't mention that he or his company worked on it, he'd still praise them in regards to sound. There was one 2003 episode that featured Black Dawn, a PlayStation 1 game, as that week's retro pick, with Tommy talking about it and giving special mention to the fact that it was one of the first games with dynamic soundtracks. For context, Black Dawn's audio side was handled by Tallarico's company. It once again only credits Tommy Tallarico Studios alongside Todd Dennis, who likely did a fair amount of the tracks too, and the sound design. So it's funny that he once again didn't mention that. There's also the fact that his first dynamic game soundtrack claim is kind of BS, because there was quite a few games prior to Black Dawn that did so. Example, Star Wars Dark Forces. But that's not too surprising, LOL. Incidentally, Black Dawn happens to be where a couple of his contributions to Sonic and the Black Knight originated from. One of those, Great Megalith, is at least a new arrangement done alongside none other than Jun Sanui himself. And the other one, Molten Mine, was just taken as is from Black Dawn. I guess he figured nobody was going to notice, but still. The even funnier thing is that it wasn't even the first time it happened. As one of the training mini games on Knockout Kings 2000 on Nintendo 64, coincidentally, by the same devs as Black Dawn, featured one of those uh, aforementioned tunes, albeit in a shortened form due to cart space limitations. Also, coincidentally, a lot of coincidences here, it was another game that had, ya boy, Joey Curse's involvement. It all ties in, lol. And if you go online, I... I Somebody recently uploaded, I think it was a sensible person, or Goose, can't remember, a video showing that he reused his music over and over again, and wouldn't it be funny if it wasn't even something Tommy created, and that Todd Dennis created, and he's just reusing other people's music in other games? That sounds like a Tommy thing to do. This is from ICICLOUI, <laughs> whatever that means, about the Cribs thing. Are we sure Gamer TV actually shot the footage because the re-upload doesn't include the Gamer TV graphics, but also isn't cropped? It seemed to be using the original footage. Why would Tallarico have original footage? Did Gamer TV send it to him? Did they upload it somewhere without post-processing? Why? Here's what I think. And this is what he thinks, the person. He shot the tour himself because he wanted a crib episode of his weird house and then went around giving it to companies until one of them published it. My money is Cribs also owns a copy of that footage because he gave it to them. And I like this comment. This is a good one. I fully, I believe he would do this. Because I also thought it was kind of weird when I saw both videos. They didn't have the same graphics on the screen. So there is, somebody has the master copy of it. And it would make sense if it was Tommy. And he has done other tour videos of his house with uh, other people. So that's even further embarrassing that he... I can see him sending it around to everyone saying, hey, put this on something. That's why it ended up on a demo disc. Super funny. I also noticed that he played with this kangaroo with a New York Yankees hat on. And that was only featured in the second video. So how would the second company be able to get extra footage that the original supposed NTV Cribs video would, would have? So I definitely agree with this comment saying that Tommy's the one who filmed all of this and provided the footage for everyone, so that's it's really sad. AJ Mortap says, Tommy Talrico was not the only composer for Advent Rising, despite the CD for the soundtrack only saying composed by Tommy Talrico on the front. Lori Robinson and Emmanuel Fratiani, a husband and wife composition duo, and my old piano teachers also composed it. It's impossible to know what the work distribution was, but this video 
Doesn't give me much reason to assume Tommy did most of it. I, I, I do think it would be interesting if someone were to do a deep dive on Advent Rising because the music is is a very strong point and was talked about a lot but i only did very basic research on it and from what i could see there was like this person i wrote there was like five or six different people who worked on the audio for the game the soundtrack and uh i i don't remember any wacky zany tunes like global gladiators type stuff in the game so i i'm wondering if tommy just did this the basic sound effects or like the menu screen while the or all the big amazing music was done by other people shooter person says so i don't mean to underplay joy's contributions to the many works he's been involved with but this is something i intentionally dug back into in the college a few years back 1993 was the starting production of the animated film cats don't dance which was eventually released in 1997 while i was watching it i noticed the roblox oof sounded at approximately an hour in the sound effect came from a character named pudge an anthrop Morphic Penguin, who is voiced by Matthew Harried. I struggled to find the credits for the individuals involved with the sound effects in the film, aside from discovering that many of the sound effects used were from house libraries. I was hoping to able to cross-reference a credit in that film with Joy's work. And a few people have said this, from a few different movies and cartoons. It's, it's, it's very similar to many other sound effects, so it's hard to prove that this one is originated from this, but it would not be it would make sense like the what would make sense is that the original oof in messiah was taken from the sound library so who knows gabe morales says the claim about being the first american ever to work on a sonic franchise is such an insanely easy thing to disprove lol dean sitton a sega of america employee also known as the literally the dude on the box art for kid chameleon wrote the sega of america bible for sonic the hedgehog in early 1991 before the first game released He's the dude who literally came up with the name Dr. Robotnik. Tommy didn't work on a Sonic game until Sonic and the Black Knight on the Wii. Like, Tommy is aware that Sonic 2 and 3 and Knuckles and Sonic Spinball and Sonic Extreme were all made in San Francisco using Americans, right? Ever heard of Mark Cerny? Dude literally hired Yuji Nakas to Sega of America for Sonic 2. Tommy Tallarico is such a piece of shit and a liar, lol. Tommy Tallarico isn't even the first American musician to work on the franchise. Howard Drosen at SOA did the soundtrack to Sonic Spinball, and famously Spencer Nielsen did the USA soundtrack to Sonic CD, both in 1993, 16 years before Tommy did his little thing. Yeah, it's one of the weirdest ones that he always referenced. And it's like a lie he... If you've seen the videos of him, sometimes the lie he doesn't even like telling people because there's interviews where he's like, oh, I worked on that Sonic game. I don't remember which one. One of the Wii ones or something. And he makes it like it's not... I was the first American to work on it, but he he makes it like such a, like a not big deal, and uh, such a weird lie to use because with obscure games it's hard to find any info on. But the game like Sonic, it's so easy to disprove. Takahashi twenty two twelve says about Metroid Prime at Space World two thousand one, Miyamoto himself said he didn't like the sound effects and had them replaced, which is why the game wasn't shown there. Kind of flies in the face of what he says about Miyamoto said about his work. Also, Howard Drosen was the first American Sonic composer doing the music for Sonic Spinball 93, a year before Sonic 3. Another funny thing, and this is CeCe Rice here, so I've seen that name before. Another funny thing about Tommy's claim with Sonic is that he claims to be good friends of Mark Cerny, who happens to be the producer of Sonic 2. And we've and everyone's covered the Metroid Prime thing numerous times before, and like in my previous video, Tommy gets confused that Metroid Prime was released on the Wii and not on the GameCube and says he's been with them he worked with them for five years when every single thing proves that he's wrong. Like if he worked with them for five years it would be impossible because Retro Studios wasn't even around five years prior to him getting fired from the, the project. So just just an awful lie that he uses. Chilenya says, Why would you be proud of a bigger venue and huge crowds for your classical orchestral performance when anyone with minimal understandings of classical music will know that the sound quality is inversely proportional to the size of the venue. An or orchestra sounds great in a theater and terrible in a football stadium. A big place and a big crowd would discourage me from buying a ticket if I were interested. Which is true. Necropolis says, I've literally spent my entire adolescence and adulthood thinking Tyler Eco did, by himself, the OST to MDK, which is, one, which is, in my opinion, one of the coolest collections of songs there are in a video game. It turns out someone else is in the credits, a man named Todd Dennis. 
And after this video, I'm not really sure I should think Tommy did anything but procure the album. So there's that. Thanks for shredding that misconception, Harris. Tommy has been on the record. He doesn't like MDK. There must have been something happened. Maybe that was his last game with Shiny. To Tommy kind of crapped on it. and But people, do, it does have a cult following, so... Okay, Miles Davini 5759 says, A couple other things that didn't get mentioned in this video. Tommy's Ferrari is apparently a fake. It's just a body kit, meaning that a car... I think that was his older vehicle, not the current one. So the second one, I'll, I'll skip past that one. The second one is he claims he has done music for Earthworm Jim, but he seems to have primarily worked on the sequel, not the first game, even though he's disingenuous about this. The first Earthworm Jim is actually credited to someone named Mark Miller, who apparently Tommy's main contribution was doing the synth arrangement heard on the Sega CD Windows port of the game. I remember seeing a quote somewhere where someone said, Mark's the main one credited because of legal reasons, but this seems to be another Tommy Joey situation where Tommy ends up taking credits for another guy's work. Interestingly, there's even a comment in this very video's comment section from someone who says the original composer was their music class instructor and specifically pointed out they originally did that game's music. I definitely believe it. In addition to this, even though it seems likely he did in fact act as a main composer for Earthworm Jim 2, like half the tracks in that game are traditional songs rather than 100% of his own comp compositions. This gives me the impression he isn't very good at doing an entire game score by himself. So you'd have others pitch in, like in the Terminator for Sega CD or Earthworm Jim's 2 case, just use traditional compositions to lighten the load. I think the end product came out to be fine, came out fine to be honest, but still tells a lot about his mentality. His third point was, I'm not so sure if he's gloated over doing the music for Aladdin for a Genesis, but he primarily worked on sound design for that game, not the soundtrack. There's a Sega 16 interview you can find where he seems to explain his main role as having just worked on translating the music from someone else's made plus the movie's tracks onto the Genesis. He even describes himself as knowing the Genesis hardware very well. Somehow though, Spot goes to Hollywood for Sega Genesis which was released in 1995 and was solely composed by him yet comes out sounding very amateurish though to his credit I think the music in that game is his best work composition wise so it makes me think he's possibly never he possibly was never too much of an expert on the Genesis. There's an unrelated SNES version of that game that had its ROM get out a couple years back where you can hear better renditions of all the songs in the Genesis version. Which makes you wonder how much, so, how someone who apparently knew the Genesis sound hardware didn't know this. This is mostly net picking, but it always struck me as sort of well off. Just to go over that last comment, I, I do remember hearing Tommy mentioning that I think he said that he used to hand off stuff to mark miller to do the, on the super nintendo like he didn't do the super nintendo stuff that he did only the genesis stuff so this kind of s makes sense and kind of contradicts what he says because if the super nintendo renditions were better makes sense because he didn't do it but I, I he has always said that he he is the genesis guy who knows what the truth is jeebus loves me says it's a beard is it a bit weird that the Acker woman is wearing the same green shirt in the video as in her profile picture on the website? Makes it look like she showed up for one day of work and bag of liar cash. I think that's what they were trying to say. And I wouldn't doubt it if she only showed up for one day. So we had several people who were audio designers and who've worked in the gaming industry doing audio sound effects chime in, mostly about what Tommy said with Metroid Prime and how he designed the sound effects and then they designed the the weapons based off his sound effects, which is absolutely insane and ridiculous. So we had a lot of people who comment in on that part. And we'll start off with this one. Pseudo Scorpion 14 says, as someone who actually works in AAA game dev, hearing Tommy describe the work process on the Metroid Prime is riotous. Now that is not how this works. That's not how anything works. Shay Furlong says, the reason Metroid Prime 4 is taking so long is because they're waiting for Tommy Talarico to finish the weapon sounds before starting the rest of the game. That's hilarious. Damien M. Art says, artist who has worked in video games here. To the suggestion that an external sound guy would be the lead on the art department's work, LOL, LMAO even. Quick note about Moby Games though, even looking up my own name didn't yield all the titles I've worked on, have been a credit for, some are the same studio and only title shows up when there are multiple under the same studio. So I wouldn't use it as a great source for finding accurate credits. Yeah, Moby isn't 100%. Regular Showman. I haven't finished the video yet, but the bit about Metroid Prime gave me a brain aneurysm. It's clear to me this dude knows extremely little about Metroid because the notion that they designed the weapons around the sound effects 
sound effects, which would, if his story were true, have been from an outsourced company who otherwise had very little creative control of the game, is insane. Metroidvanias are in a lot of ways pretty much designed around the player's kit. Because weapons have a practical use outside of combat, I'm not sure which one tends to come first in the game design, the world or the, wep world or the weapons, but his story means the weapons would have came first, and the idea that Retro Studios would have designed basically the entire game around. I didn't click read more, but you get the gist of it. So a lot of these comments are about Tommy's, what he had said about Metroid Prime and how they he created the sounds and they then designed the weapons based around the sound, which is absolute insane. And this one's a pretty good example of it because they talk about, like he's it's an outsourced company. So is Metroid really going to be designed by an outsourced Tommy Tallarico Studios, like the whole game and the weapons? Like that's pure insanity and such ridiculousness that who in the world would actually believe that? Lil X says, great video as always, fella. Another point on the audio for Metro Prime is that Tommy claims he had no images or idea of the weapons prior to making the weapons. I recently graduated from SAE Music and Tech and Sound Engineering and am currently going for a Master's in Foley Sound Effects. As someone who's worked on Foley for around four years now, we never make the sound effects for us. There's no basis for how you're supposed to give a character to the sound in any way at all. It's another person laughing at the idea. And the fact that Tommy would say this as the premier sound world record holder and all that it, it he i imagine the people in the game industry really laugh at this guy like he might i almost feel sorry for him because i can only picture them all laughing and reading this stuff and laughing so hard but let's continue on fluffy critter says i make sounds and music for indie games and i can't imagine caring this much about elaborating so much on detailed process of creating a 0.3 second sound effect Heck, there's sounds I recorded three days ago that I probably struggled to remember how I did then. Edit. Oh god, just got the bit about gang. That whole organization was a useless scam, where they basically got a lot of video game audio artists to pay stupid amounts of money to join a crappy forum that didn't even work most of the time. Also, they clay they called their meetups gang hangs, which is just yikes. I only paid my dues once and then never bothered again. So there we go, we have our someone who was part of the gang network. And it sounds like it's just like a scam, just to get people's money. And we we, we had a co another comment about that, saying it's pretty much a waste of time. Ragna the Pig says, It's a small thing, but I love how the way he describes making the sounds for Metroid Prime. On top of being a ridiculous way to work, makes absolutely no sense for Metroid, a franchise that already has an established visual identity. They're not going to model your weapons after your sound effects, Tommy. They already know what Samus's power beam looks like. This one is from a familiar face, RGT85. LOL, this is amazing. I had some interaction with him over the Amico stuff. The initial trailer was super interesting. Earthworm Jim 4 tickled my nostalgia. But I could tell after that and the lack of product, something was off. He also asked me for my address to send me a shirt in the early days, which I did. And he said he dated a girl from this town when he was younger. Did he lie about that? Son of a bitch. So it looks like in the earlier days, Tommy was targeting the larger influencer crowd, like RGT85. I guess that's why he got John Riggs and Metal Jesus a little bit at the very beginning. So uh, it's unfortunate for Tommy he had to settle for the small channels like DJC and Mike Mullis or Retro Bro. The Piano Slave 1 says, I remember going to the video game live concert in Pittsburgh when I was in high school with a friend. It was really enjoyable and there was an opportunity to meet with some of the main performers after the concert, Tommy included. This being in the early 2000s, and my friend and I being huge Kingdom Hearts fans, we excitedly told him how much we enjoyed the concert. He asked what our favorite parts were, and when we told him it was the Kingdom Hearts section, he gave us such an annoyed, condescending expression that I still remember it to this day. Hearing what a narcissist he is, I wonder if he was just unhappy we didn't like the part where he came out to do a guitar solo, or couldn't take any credit for it. Well, most likely that is the case. He is definitely bitter and jealous of others. The Israeli Ranter says, I remember seeing G4 in some of the shows that included Tommy back when I was a kid. My two distinct memories of him was that the house tour where he, the British guy hated his house. This is yeah. absolutely hideous. This is not real. What? No, it is. It's all real. This is not... Are you sure? The second one was when he and Victor reviewed a voice control game called Lifeline, and Tommy kept giving voice commands to the main female character to take off her clothes. What a role model he sure was. And yeah, just... More, more examples of how this guy 
not the face you want to have for a family friendly console. Sarzian says, fantastic video. You unlocked a memory I had repressed about Tommy Tallarico. In November 2008, I worked promo and merch at a video games live show when it came to my city in the UK as part of a culture event. I was not paid for handling, handing out flyers nor for selling the merch, instead being volunteered through my college. I didn't get to watch any of the show as I was instructed to wait until it ended in case someone loved the show so much that they'd leave to come buy merch in the foyer. So at the end, when someone asked Tommy's brother on my behalf if I could get like a commemorative t-shirt as compensation for my work, he looked at me like he was mentally calculating how much my time and effort was worth to him. As he made it very clear we didn't sell nearly enough merch to make the show a worthwhile venture, presumably also factoring in that I looked like the sort who would blast them online, how right he was. Anyways, I still have the shirt. That experience forever changed my perception of how many unsung, uncredited, unpaid individuals the greats used to hoist them up, and I've always strived to give credit to everyone involved in a project as a result. So there you go. So this looks like they also used volunteers to sell the merch. That's that's pretty lame. Tiny Toil says, At this point, I'm honestly convinced that Joey is the actual owner of the house, and he just lets Tommy live in it, in it out of pity. That's funny. A random user says, I noticed how Tommy suddenly gets a case of itchy on the back of his head or face. That also seems to happen when he speaks of his titanic labor on Metroid. And yeah, it's just like when I did my first You Know video showing all the different tells of Tommy telling lies. He, he, he does really make it obvious when he lies by scratching his face or using the words you know. Mike Sully 110 says, Strange, he lists Unreal 1's mission pack Return to Napali, yet the music for the expansion was made by the same two composers who did the original, Alexander and Michel. Two or three tracks in the original Unreal were done by others. Necros did the Scarge bath bass track, but I couldn't find Tommy's name or his company in any of the UMX files for Unreal. Okay, he's listed under sound effects, but the only sounds added to Return to Napali were common stock sound effects. Most of them are stock sound effects heard many times before, such as the spinner spidey, spinner spider enemy squeals, which leaves the weapon sounds. But that would account for under 5 seconds of actual sound. Does he count 5 seconds of sound in this record? Plus, why would Epic Games go to the hassle of consulting just for 3 weapon sounds? And I bet you a lot of games fall under this too, where a company just bought the generic sound CDs and used one or two effects and Tommy likes to credit himself as being part of the game. And I find that to be very, very lame. A random user says, I went to a video games live concert years ago. It was a good show, but they didn't tell us what they'd be playing, which led to some bad feelings. If you see a band, you can generally assume they'll be playing their own catalog. If you see a normal symphony, you'll know exactly what classical pieces they're playing. I didn't recognize a lot of the video game soundtracks they played, which was a bit disappointing, but they were still cool. The biggest problem was the ads and posters had Triforces on them, and my group was mostly looking forward to the Zelda music and they didn't play any. And it wasn't just us. When they announced the show was ending, the whole crowd started chanting, Zelda, Zelda. The orchestra was packing away their instruments and a singer came out and led us in an unaccompanied, still alive from Portal. It is a bittersweet memory because the sing-along was a fun idea, but if they felt they were trying to make us shut up about Zelda, such an absurd situation. At the time, I was a kid, I was disappointed and confused, but not really able to express myself. But now looking back as an adult, that was straight up false advertising. Anyway, I don't know who put the Triforces on the ads, but left Koji Kondo out of the program. But I've been low-key pissed off at them for years. If it connects to Tommy, then that's pretty rich. LOL. Well, I would probably wouldn't be pissed for years about that. It seems kind of, kind of odd that the person would be still holding a grudge. But that is kind of bait and switch that they're promising. Because a lot of people want to hear Zelda because that's the, one of the greatest soundtracks for any series of games, so if they have it on the advertisements, they really should be playing it. Bangulo says, I contacted Tommy back in 2004 on MySpace, asking him about the track Wreck of the Conception. Now he has re-uploaded it, titled Shipwrecked from the game Treasure of the Deep, and I was always a huge fan of the beautiful nylon guitar on it. So I was asking him what they used to record the track and what kind of guitar he used, etc. At the time, the game was about six years old. 
But one thing that always struck with me is how he didn't remember much about the recording process for the track, like not even what DAW he used or any detail about the guitar, which is the main instrument in that track. I was excited at the time to even get a reply back, but now after watching this video, I'm even questioning how much music did he also even write? I am now thinking the guitar on there and maybe that track completely is not even his, since he was so vague about it. I remember doing a MySpace blog about it and I have screenshots somewhere but unfortunately the Wayback Machine didn't save anything of my MySpace profile from back then. So there you go, we had someone asking about information about the tunes and you would think a guy like Tommy who's so narcissistic and has such an ego that if anyone actually wanted to know more about anything he wrote musically that he would be all up in it. So if he currently has all the time in the world to, or he did last year, talking to 14 year old kids and every single person on YouTube about his uh, intelligent Miko, you think he would give this guy some answers about question, about questions on the musical track he created himself. So I'm guessing someone else wrote the track. Bruner writes, I do believe it's pronounced uh dot wave. That's a good one, especially after my last video where he says uh a lot. Rabbit Ears CH says, after watching this whole rabbit hole of lies, appropriate with that username there, I remember something that I found strange. For over a decade, I've heard the name Tommy Tallarico thrown around as a famous composer, but it's been very different from the other way the way the other video game composers get talked about. You talk about Tim Fullen, someone links you Pictionary. You talk about Grant Kirkhope, and you get something magical from DKC or something silly from Banjo. You talk about Dean Evans, and you get the hauntingly beautiful song he slapped onto a Flintstones game to pad the sound test. Tommy never seems to be associated with a song or work like that when he's discussed, and I generally think it's because there's so much fluff that nobody's ever checked. It's a good point. Some strange looking fella named Movie Madness Entertainment says, I'm the guy dressed as a serial killer in the vid. Oof, great job. I wonder if wonder if he got upset with all those remarks on him. Death Metal Indian says he's the Frank Ducks of video games. <laughs> if you're not, or is it Dukes, sorry. If you're not familiar with Frank Dukes, look up, uh, was it Bloodsport or Kickboxer? And he, he's the Tommy Tallarico of the martial arts scene. It's absolutely hilarious. He may be worse than Steven Seagal. Uh, maybe he's not quite as bad as Seagal, but they are very similar. This one was posted like hundreds of times. Fun fact, in Brazilian Portuguese, Talarico is a slang for someone that steals their friends' romantic partners. Even his name means something untrustworthy. And that was brought up a lot. That comment and also about how his, his uh, pot light was dangling from the ceiling. I think I saw like 100 people wrote, wrote about that. Trey Hill says, Tommy's the guy at the party who wants to impress you with how cool he is, but he didn't bother to get his story straight. Every time he hesitates and says, um, he's definitely constructing a lie. And we've proven that over and over again. The story about Tommy reminds me, this is from Sa Sauks. The story about Tommy reminds me of the time I caught a two meter fish. I was fishing out on the lake in my Ferrari when out of nowhere a 10 meter fish bites the line I totally designed. Then after I hauled this three ton fish out of the lake, I continued to work closely with him for five years on Metroid Prime. I currently hold the Guinness record for longest deep sea fishing expedition in gaming. That guy is hilarious. That was awesome. Manatee, manatees and mermaids. Oh, don't talk about mermaids around Tommy. Can you imagine how proud Tommy's mom must be of Joey Curras? <laughs> that's, that's so funny. A user named Pat the NES Bunk says, I'm very interested in learning about this Tommy Tallarico, a person I have never heard of before and who definitely ne never personally attacked me before in any way. The next one is from Hey It's Sherry 175 I just can't believe that New York Yankees minor league Hall of Famer Tommy Tallarico would lie to us like this. And that's another funny story that the bomber guy completely did not cover but should be covered. Tommy pretending he's a professional baseball player and a Hall of Famer. That's hilarious. Gatoruz Inc. says, even two hours couldn't fit in all of Tommy's lies. For example, claiming in an investment document, no less, to be a Yankees Hall of Fame baseball player. Not making that up, but he was. It was a fantasy baseball camp where you get Hall of Fame awards if you attend five times at a cost of five grand per time. Stag from TOS says, imagine being the sound designer for Earthworm Jim and saying, hey man, I really love all your Mario stuff, to Shigeru Miyamoto. It'd be like an undergrad physicist saying, hey man, I really love all your relativity stuff to Albert Einstein. Er, 
I'm even now doubting whether Shigzi really created Mario. Is anything real these days? And that's a good point. As if you would address Miyamoto. I really like all your Mario stuff. That's that's hilarious. And this one is from East Coast Italian. Legal incoming. Looks like I can add another name to my hater folder. Congrats. I will say how absolutely wrong you were in the whole video. I just talked to my good friend Miyamoto Shigi this morning and he was very upset at how you depicted me in this video. Gaming racist. Like you are what's wrong with the gaming community these days. And you should be ashamed of yourself and all the 78,000 haters who like this video. I'm an East Coast Italian. It's just part of my personality. But if you did actual research on me, then you would know that. And that was from East Coast Italian. That face looks familiar. Mady says, MF Doom wannabe motherfucker is the funniest thing. And Sith of Darkness says, Italians dot wave. <laughs> That's good. Humphrey Spelling Bee 1732 says, The fact that Tommy, a gentleman who made an adult decision to make his house look like it was designed by a 12-year-old boy playing Sims with every expansion pack, is weirdly embarrassed that he holds the world record for the most video game concerts performed is somehow both the most and least surprising part of this video. Art Turbite 2681 says, As someone who has made a bunch of sounds for little game jams here and there, I can assure you there is no way in hell you spend half an hour on something like the oof sound. You record a human voice, slap a pitch shifter, plug in, and maybe do some EQ and compression. That's it. This guy is such a fraud. And that's what I had said earlier with the Scott Baird comment. Vampirilius749 says, Dude, I'm so mad this is the man who owns Intellivision now. And I have a lot of fond memories of playing Intellivision games with my dad because those were the games he was nostalgic for. And he wanted to show them to me. I love those games. And they're going to go down in flames because... Tommy needs his ego boost. Depressing. And yet, that's another good point. There is not many, but there is some in television, like the old school fans. And if I were a fan of them, I would be also disappointed that knowing that moving forward, that a good chance that television will never ever be shown ever again and there'll be nothing of it. So he, he ruined the legacy instead of, in his mind, take conquering Atari and making it in television reborn again. So. That is kind of sad and depressing. Paper Bago 17 says, Tommy probably doesn't even own his own house. It's all a prop. And it's a funny thing they should mention that because on the subreddit, I won't post it here, someone has shown that Tommy has remortgaged his house a few times, which is a bit odd considering like the price that was listed wasn't that high. And you would think for being a rock star and having all that money, he would have be able to pay off the house you know especially since it contained all those expensive stuff like the spider-man comics but minecraft miner says someone should ask tommy if he worked on sea of thieves secular sam says this guy desperately needs a psychiatrist he's also deleting comments off his mtv cribs youtube video and i read somewhere else that he has been deleting comments on youtube as much as like a lot of different videos so if you do have anything that is eye-opening. Make sure you to get a screen grab or something because he's going around trying to erase all the stupid things he's wrote, written. And I know it'll be impossible because he's done it so much, but very interesting. So he is, he is aware. Boodle in a can says, What EP was Tommy's show? Growing up, I didn't know who he was or even cared about him. I still don't care about him. But I always saw him as the guy that had a complexion. Like, he wanted to be bigger than he was. Sure, he had a pretty cool energy and all, but his co-host was the professional one who knew his stuff. Tommy is more of the edgy, enjoyer one. Zanith Zarda, who I've seen posted quite a bit, said, Not Tommy's show, he was just a callous, unlikable bag of pugs. It was Vic's show. And I want to bring this up again, because he credits himself frequently about being the co-founder of Electric Playground. And... Victor Lucas has told the story a few times. He originally created the web page, and then he created the show and needed someone with, you know, an insider into the business to help him with the show and to also expand the show down to California because they had a they wanted to expand to the states. So Tommy was like, I know he helped him with the show, and then in the credits there's like Joey Curras and a bunch of other people. So he he's definitely involved with the show, but. He was only part of the show for the first 
few years, and the show went on for about 20 years, I think. And at its peak, it was definitely not him and Tommy. It was him with, like, Scott Jones or someone else. So yet another thing that he, he yes, he was a part of the show, but he, he didn't create it, is what I'm saying. Don Davis says, I've seen video games live three times, and at one show he mentioned composing for Sonic. I don't remember if he claimed to be the first American to work on Sonic. Probably not because I'm in Canada and Canadians don't care about American machismo. And someone in the audience went, woo. And Tommy said, it wasn't any of the good ones. This moment of self-effacement has been on my mind after watching this video. Curious about where that Tommy is. And he's done that a few times. And that, that's weird. With Sonic, he's, he said in a couple interviews, that, oh, it's not one of the good ones. Which is weird because he's worked on a ton of like shit games, so I don't know why he wouldn't be proud of it. But he also did it with MDK. He, he made it seem like, oh yeah, MDK wasn't that good. And both those games, as far as we know, the music that he provided was created by someone else. So maybe there's there's a story there. Who knows? Reach seventy twenty says, as someone who currently works in the game voiceover. I can say for almost certain that Tommy's recollection of the recording and editing process for the Oof Sound is comically suspect at best. While I can't speak for every studio and or engineer, I can assure that it's extremely unlikely that anyone, Tommy or Joey, would remember a single detail about a throwaway grunt sound 20 years ago. And this is, once again goes to my point with uh, Scott Baird. I've edited thousands of lines of voiceover and I wouldn't be able to recall lines of dialogue I worked on a week ago, let alone decades ago. Not unless it was unique or significant somehow. And the sad part is that most audio engineers know this. Tommy doesn't have to lie to a group he is already a untrustworthy authority in, but his compulsiveness just won't let him stop. And that's why I said before. And the last line is pretty good uh, thing to bring up about him being his compulsiveness of just lying. Can He can't help himself. And uh, that's just his personality. Puxer B says, I've seen video games live, and I remember my friends and I looked at each other when the concert finished and said something along the lines, wow, the orchestra did a great job, but that host was kind of a douche. This is so surreal because I've never given this dude a single moment of thought, and now you've made my a nearly two-hour long expose on him. It's hilarious. So yet another not person not a fan of his antics. Computer Weekend says, when I was on AOL, 1998-ish, I was 13, Tommy I am to me. It's funny because that's old di- <laughs> old lingo. I am to in AOL. Anyways, Tommy I am to me directly after I had sent him an email gushing about how much I loved Wild Nine. I asked him to some questions about getting into the game audio and what kind of game Messiah was. It was on the back of the Wild Nine box, and his answers were pretty generic. But I was so excited to be talking to him, so I didn't care. When I told him. Wex was my favorite character. The entire conversation switched to how he was the inspiration of the character's looks, and they used his voice, and I did this, and I did that. While I didn't raise any red flags at the time, I am now 100% sure that I was actually talking to him. He was self-aggrandizing and egotistical at the time. I figured he'd earned it. Everyone else did, I guess. So that's another funny story of him gushing when someone shows that they're interested. So does he look like the Wex character? You be the judge. M. Scotty 90 says, I find it strangely hilarious how he hasn't hung any of those Guinness records up on his wall. He's so proud of them and just has them sitting on the floor. <laughs> that, that was weird. You think out of everything he cherishes that he'd put those front and center in his house. And he has so much stuff on his walls. Like when, when you watch the whole house tour, he has tons of pictures and artwork from Disney. You think he'd have somewhere to put his uh, Guinness records. Pumpkin Mary AM says, This Kami guy's voice sounds almost exactly like Butch Hartman's voice, and they even have similar personalities, LMFAO. And I had no idea who Butch Hartman is until after reading all these comments. I saw probably 100 comments talking about Butch Hartman. And I have to say, they do look quite similar. They It looked like they could be relatives. And for the brief uh, YouTube clips I, I saw, he was really... Uh, not sure if the word is egotistical, but he really pumped himself up. And what's really funny is that in this clip, I'll, I'll play a little bit of it. He even talks like Tommy saying, you know, so many times. Like, you know, 
uh, when I was growing up, I loved Happy Days. I oh, loved, gosh, you know, yeah. I yeah. loved, um, you know, I even like going back to the 70s, I loved Taxi and I loved, you know, yeah. Cheers. And, so good. Yeah, exactly. And I, I... Rhubarb and Crusted, I like that name. I've got a little story relating to this video. Indulge me. I went to a gig last Sunday, UK Subs in Bradford. They were ace. And on my way back, me and my brother prop popped into the pub for a pint of Guinness. We got our drinks and sat down. We're chatting away normally, but I can't help overhear what the other two people in the room are chatting about over a pint each. They hadn't said anything that specific, but I was adamant I knew what they were talking about. I go up to them and say, sorry to interrupt, but are you talking about Tommy Tallarico? We proceeded to discuss this video for about half an hour at close to midnight in an empty pub before I had to go and walk my dog. It's strange how things like this happen. Well, at least uh, Tommy's name is getting out there, not in the positive way, but a lot of people are talking about him these days. Mist Man 1210 says, just want to throw it out there that the current president of the Game Audio Network Guild is Brian Schmidt, and he is legit. He got a start on pinball and worked on the infamous Black Knight 2000 soundtrack, along with Dan Forden and Steve Ritchie, a detail he always mentions when he talks about it. Crazy, right? And worked on audio tech for the Xbox. He later started Game Sound Con, which has gotten pretty big. All this to say Gang is probably pretty cool these days with Tommy gone. And it would be interesting if someone were to do a full video about the gang network because uh, from what I've read Tommy hasn't been involved at all since 10 plus years and I'm wondering if uh, he was ousted or how it all how his tenure there worked so would be interesting hint hint for someone to do Lunar Ray Dew says, I sang in a video games live concert once. They scouted people from my high school chorus and a local church choir. The performance was unpaid, but it was a fun experience. I met Tommy Tallarico without knowing who he was until now, except a guy who worked on a lot of games, and asked him for advice on getting into video games VA. He just kind of looked at me weird and gave some half-baked answer that essentially amounted to, I don't know, which honestly was fair. So there we go. Another example of video games live getting free help from students and I really surprised I didn't realize after all these years that they would have to go to get free help and take advantage of young people who just want exposure or experience it's kind of sad from a girl named Laura who was in video games live and was one of the main members like a featured player in video games live and I'll play clips at the end showing what she did but we'll read off the Twitter stuff here first. It says, I'm still thinking about this insane video and its coverage of the 2009 Brazil customs debacle. I was on that tour and one of the band members implicated in the structuring lie. If you're wondering whether that had major legal ramifications for all of us, you're correct. And what she's talking about is the story that's been shared everywhere since uh, the last year or so, where Tommy was caught trying to smuggle $100,000 out of Brazil and use the excuse that Oh, he's going to give each of the band members holding a certain amount of the money to break it up. So it's not just him holding it. Thinking that somehow that this would get him out of trouble. So he, as she's saying, implicated. She included all these band members who were to completely out of the loop and had no idea this was happening. Which is insane because had something worse happened, especially when you're in South America... That could really impact these people's lives, you know, get a criminal record, have them stuck in Brazil. And at the time, I'm not sure her age, but she would have been early 20s, like a really young person. So just, uh, I think this is the most horrendous, well, I know I've heard other actually worse stories than this, but worst story I've heard about Tommy that's been public. I'll say that. And it's just, just, I don't know how anyone can defend the guy defend the guy after hearing this story because it's 100 percent legit and i'll agree with ian and saying absolute scumbag like this is just scummy stuff so following that up flora says friends of mine have heard me tell a story but i have never said anything publicly until now because well why it was just a silly clerical error in the report that we all became suspects of homeland security or so i was told at the time by the guy committing the crime I generally try to keep my personal issues off the internet. I detest the fact that I'm even writing this right now. But I never saw those court documents until the H-Bomber guy video last week. And they tell a very different story that I was given in 2009. And now, I, I, I'm not legal expert or anything, but 
I wonder if the people who were on this trip could come after Tommy legally now because he, I'm not sure if it's fraud or misrepresentation or withholding stuff that could be extremely criminal against them. Just, uh, just awful stuff. She continues on by saying, I has I always had my suspicions that something was missing from the story, and I have learned bits of info over the years that removed some of the wool from my eyes. But I did not expect a revelation that he knowingly blatantly lied about all of us, risking our futures to save his own skin. It's difficult to unpack these memories about video games live after so many years have passed. I still have a lot of conflicting emotions surrounding that time in my life. I was very optimistic, I deeply believed in the show and the team behind it, and wanted to see it succeed. In hindsight, that's a dangerous spot to be in with a charismatic leader who has so little regard for honesty. It's incredibly easy for you, your trust to be abused repeatedly without you realizing it at first. I feel for, I feel for all of us and I've had to learn the hard way. And I think a lot of the Miko cult people could read the that last little bit there and maybe they should take it in, think about it, process it. And I know what they did with uh, Tommy isn't nearly on the same level as what Tommy did to screw over these people like Laura but it's just it shows that this is the, this is his character he's not your friend he's not a good guy the guy is all about himself does he will do anything to protect his own self and throw everyone else under the bus no regards to people no respect for the, the people who helped him out got him to where he is just an, Tommy's a, a fucking horrible human being no questions about it can't defend him at all Kristen, who says, remember the video games live, or sorry, remember the time when instead of paying us as guest soloists for video games live, he made you split your paycheck the, that day for five ways, LOL. And Laura replied, do I, LMAO. So once again, not paying his his talent, but somehow being able to pocket 100000 in his po- in his pocket in Brazil. Hmm. Interesting, he can't pay these people. So replying to that that post by Kristen, Doug says, There was one show Laura split with me where I didn't even get paid. I was so excited about doing it, I didn't even realize I never got anything until way too late. Laura, Laura replies, If it makes you feel any better, I wasn't paid for the very first two shows I did, and my payment for the four-show Brazil tour was an iPod Touch. Like, seriously? He paid someone an iPod Touch for four shows during that Brazil tour where he had $100,000 in his pocket. Like, this is... Hello, Amigo Cultus people. DJC, Mike Mullis, Geeks of Cash, Rab, Rel Gamer, whoever else that still defends this guy. This guy had $100,000 in his pocket and he gave a featured per- performer on Video Games Live who is young in Brazil an iPod Touch. Like, how do you defend that? So, continues on, Laura says, the excitement overtakes all common sense. I was just... A dumb kid fresh out of college being handed this gig on a silver platter. I didn't know any better and didn't want to jeopardize my chances for asking by asking for money. Never work without a contract, folks. VJ says, yeah, this was my mentality too. I never got paid for a single show because I just wanted to make something of it. Paid my own expenses too, except for the last show I did. He actually got me a hotel for that one. So that that also is insane. These people had to pay their own trans and their own hotel? Like, what in the world? Like... Yeah, once again, $100,000 in his pocket. It doesn't even matter the, the chosen United States or wherever it was. The fact that these people had to pay for their own, their own hotel and their own, like, everything. That's, this, this guy is, I don't, I don't try to think of a, a word I can use, but, like, it's almost like he's using slave labor there. It's just, this guy is terrible. So there's not a whole lot more with within Laura's, uh, Twitter, but I thought I'd play a few clips showing. So she wasn't just some background character; she was a featured performer. And I don't, I didn't look into details of how she joined Video Games Live. But from what I gathered, she did some Zelda pieces on YouTube. Tommy found her, invited her, invited her. She was so excited because young, inexperienced, took advantage of somebody's being naive and used her basically, and try, used her to a point where she almost went to or could have went to jail. Just because he's greedy and didn't give a shit about her, so so here's the clips of her, and then after that, I'll go to the next story.
Okay, for our next story, this one is probably the most disturbing story. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I saw it two different places recently, and it was brought up a long time ago also, so it's been around this, this rumor slash story, but it comes from Toronto Van, and it says, I worked for Greedy Productions, the parent company for Electric Playground and Reviews on the Run, for a number of years. In that time, I saw some shit. 90% of the time, the hosts would prepare for the reviews by reading what other publications had scored it to make sure their scores weren't too far off from what other journalists gave it. Some of the time, games would be played for minutes, if at all, before giving it a score. I guess the, the exception to that would have been the Smash Brothers and how they both gave it like a 2.5. Tommy moved his younger female cousin to his house in California, and they were together for about a year. Victor and the rest of our team were well aware of the relationship but were told the show would die without Tommy, so there was nothing they could do. So when he traveled to cover games and do reviews, Greedy would cover the costs for her. Nothing criminal, obviously, but it put the crew in a really weird spot. Looking back on it, years gone by, more could have been done. Well, that's pretty disturbing. So they're saying that he is dating his cousin, or he had dated his cousin for a year. And that's uh, that wasn't the only post that said that, because in the H Bomber Guy video, Somebody by the name of Soul of Mischief says, Little fact that remains mostly undiscovered. When Tommy was working on an electric playground in the mid-2000s, when Tommy was in his late 30s, he was dating his 19-year-old first cousin. Ask Victor Lucas about it. Well, don't ask Victor about that because he, clearly he won't say anything. And uh, he's still friends with Tommy and I'm sure he doesn't want to get involved at all. But uh, that's another person saying that he was dating his first cousin. So that's, if true, and then what they'll say if true because I don't know if it's true or not but if true that is absolutely disturbing and maybe he's trying to take after his uh, quote unquote cousin Steven Tyler because uh, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of it but Steven when he was uh, younger in the beginning of Aerosmith he was dating a 14 year old girl and uh, I remember reading the stories and I'll put some screen caps there on, on the screen here but when when he was young he somehow legally adopted or got guardianship from the parents of a 14-year-old girl who was a, who was apparently a groupie and took her with him on tour so just that that is absolutely disgusting like I, i'm i don't know why that's not brought up more because the guy is a grown adult and he's 14-year-old girl like that's that's just disgusting and it wasn't his only time because when he was in his 60s he also was dating Apparently Clint Eastwood's daughter, who was only like 18 or 19, and he was like 65, so maybe it runs in the family that they, uh, quote-unquote family, assuming that they're actually family, but maybe it runs in their family that they both like the, the young ladies, because I know Tommy's wife, or possibly ex-wife, is considerably younger than him, so uh, I just thought I'd read that out. You can be the judge if it's true or not, but if true, that's that's just disturbing. Schwartzify says, I have some unsurprising news for you. When Tommy's performing guitar live at his VGL shows, his guitar part is actually pre-recorded. It's 100% fake. Even the feedback sound you hear when he plugs in his guitar is fake. In addition, a lot of the performances are a mix with a piped-in soundtrack, so the performances vary with how real they are actually are. And his source is he's played in some VGL shows. So there's more confirmation that Tommy is not playing live, and it was quite obvious that he wasn't because just how bizarre he hams it up on stage but I wonder if he can actually play guitar at all that'd be interesting to find out so this one's from the subreddit saying from no flower 4987 so back in like 2000 to 2003 Tommy was really pushing for video game music to have its own category in the Grammys as a way to legitimize the music arguably arguably a good thing right games are technically eligible since 1999 but none really even secured a nomination in the and other media category so he finally gets the attention of the Grammy committee who agrees to consider some game soundtracks. After the committee is saying they don't believe there's sufficient quantity of game soundtracks coming out each year to justify a category into itself. So what does Tommy do? He takes every soundtrack that came out in the last few years, regardless of quality, and puts them in a cardboard box and mails them to the Grammy committee. So the committee gets this loose box of 30 soundtrack CDs just kicking around with no documentation, no credit or reason for nomination. And they're like, what the fuck is this? And that's why it took another 20 years before games had their own category in the Grammys. Okay, it's one reason they stopped taking him seriously, and it was, in fact, a bit set back for the medium. 
Everything with him is just sloppy, execute it quickly, throw it at the wall, and see what sticks, regardless of the damage done. So that's an interesting story. It's not, uh, who knows if it's true or not, but it would not surprise me. But uh, I would be, I'm surprised that he wouldn't have just sent his own soundtracks to the Grammy community, the best of Tommy Tallarico or whatnot, but... Okay, for the next little bit, uh, I saw this on the subreddit today, and it's from uh, Emilio Estevez's stash, and he noticed that in Tommy's house tour that he had a couple of years back with the, the same one where the guy was shown the Guinness Book of Records and where the floor was really dirty, but he posted this little clip here, and I never noticed this when I've watched this video, and it's only only watched it a few times, but you'll see on the floor... They have uh, puppy pads, you know, for their dog. And it's just absolutely littered with urine and there's some crap on there too. But if you look closely, and it's kind of hard to see behind the piano, but the everything is covered in piss on the right behind the piano. And there's like four or five piss stains on the on the right hand part of the, the pads. That is uh, that's incredibly weird, especially because for many, many reasons. First of all, he works from home, so why wouldn't he take his dog outside? To go to the bathroom, and usually people who lay pads are like that. That's 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 for lazy people who don't want to do the work. And second of all, the, I guess the bigger thing is he he knows he's having a house tour with his neighbor here. You think he would clean it up beforehand? <laughs> like there's no shame in having this in like how much it would smell. Also, I can only imagine how bad it smelled with like six or eight piss stains in there. It's just I don't know. I just. I found it to be very odd, and I, I can't remember if he is married at this point or not, but his wife is like an animal lover or a vet or something like that. And most most vets would not recommend even using puppy pads. It's like it's only used, usually you only use it for emergency case scenarios. So just, I just thought I'd show this clip because I thought it was disgusting, and I thought you guys would find it pretty interesting too. So, yikes. I could, I could only imagine how, ba how bad it but smelled it's, uh, in there. It's what came from that. So, yeah, and have you always been a classical music guy? Uh, or, no, rock yeah. and roll, really. Yeah. You know, uh, you know my uh, cousins, Stephen Tyler from Aerosmith. Mr. Clone 985 wrote, and I uh, apologize for the bad grammar here, even though he edited this, it says, This is amazing. Just remember me the movie Coco where all the trauma is about to people stealing achievements and letting the original one just pass away as a fraud or even forgotten about, as the movie uses the brilliant way. I think what he's trying to say is, in the movie Coco, it's very similar to Tommy Tallarico, where he steals somebody else's uh, music, and then everyone forgets about the guy, the original, like the guy who wrote the music, and he fades away into obscurity. So maybe it's the similarity between Joey Curras and Tom, Tommy and doing the same thing. So I, I like it. This was one of the actually really good ones that... Not too many people were talking about, but it's from Jamie Scott, who is a professional in the gaming industry, and I'll put his list of credits on the screen here. He says, this was just brilliant. TT isn't a top worth, topic worthy of this kind of journalistic masterwork, but I'm so grateful that you guys did it. Those of us who have been in the game audio industry since the 90s have always known this guy as a massive snake oil salesman, but now the hard facts are out there thanks to you. Bravo. So there you go. One of his peers... Well aware of uh, Tommy and who he is, agreeing that the guy is a fraud, and uh, I'm I I'm it'd be so interesting to hear from other people in the industry who does audio what they think of Tommy, and more more so the guys that's been that were around from the '90s to the early aughts. I'd, I'd love to hear more stories about him. So for the next story we have, this is a long one, so I apologize in advance. And I'm, I'll probably skip a few parts because there's just so much words and so much wordiness that this one person had wrote that I just don't want to bore everyone to death. But a couple weeks ago on the subreddit, somebody had it has taken issue with one of my shorts I had uploaded. I had uploaded a short video basically showing the clip of Scott Baird in the comment section of the H Bomber Guy video showing that he was present during the recording of the oof and talked about how a girl hit herself in the stomach and how she made the oof noise. And he was present verifying that, yes, indeed, Tommy was 
at least present in the room when the oof sound was created. I had doubts on this. I don't believe that this story is true. And that was my opinion. And somebody on Reddit here with the name of Cloud Appropriate said, Ninja, you were one of my two favorite personalities documenting the whole Amico debacle. I have to say that out front because the second comment is more about my personal disappointments than anything else. It's common for YouTubers who are trying to grow their channel to use titles that are designed to attract people's attention. Your short is called The Oof Sound Was Made by a Little Girl Punching Herself. As Gator Ruse points out in his comments on your video, Scott states that the sound they captured was based on a f her spoken oof, not her motions that were like a kitten swatting themselves, which sounds far from a punch. I never would have pegged the kind of guy who would stoop to the bottom feeder ways to promote a video. I hope you aren't. And I thought that was kind of odd because uh, mostly I wrote that in jest because that's what it, it basically, that's what it said in the comment. So clearly, I, no, I didn't think that this girl actually punched herself hard in the stomach. And the reason I wrote that title is because just of the ridiculousness of that notion that a six-year-old girl would hit herself in the stomach to make the oof noise. And just the whole story behind it, if you watch the video or read the comment, it, it just it just seems extremely weird. So, of course, I'm making fun of it. And Anyways, I responded. The, I said, the point of the title is the ridiculous story that the guy gave about getting the sound file. I really doubt a six-year-old would punch herself in the stomach in order to get a sound file for an extremely unimportant part of the game. So, basically, what I just said. Cloud appropriate response to say a story is ridiculous is to call him a liar with no evidence to back it up. There's so much cognitive bias going on that Barrett has no way to defend himself because it's likely that people will assume he is lying whatever he says. Am I making an assumption with no basis? If I'm not, how could he defend his reputation in a way that would satisfy you? And at this point, I something seems a bit off. And it doesn't really make sense. Like, why would someone go out of their way? Because this is not even a, what a typical uh, a fan of Tommy or the Amico would, would write. This seems so random that some random person would just go out of their way to say this stuff. So I had responded, I'm a gambling man and I like to play the odds. Tommy and his associates have lied basically 99% of the time. So I'm going to assume it's a lie. The odds of someone being able to fondly recollect recording a single sound effect from 20 years ago on a game at the time which wasn't a big deal is extremely unlikely. I go by what Judge Judy always says. If it doesn't make logical sense, then it's a lie. I can't remember what her exact phrasing is, but she used to always say that, saying if it doesn't make sense, it's not the truth. And the whole story that Scott had written out, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Like it doesn't... Like Why would someone remember... A small sound effect from 20 years ago and why would they go through all this this isn't an iconic sound effect like mario doing his jump or an important diet like line of dialogue for a game this is just a random throwaway sound effect so cloud responds he says in his comment that everyone at the was at the session okay sorry he says in his comment that everyone at the session including the guy who played god was amused by her attempt at a read by that logic in 20 years you won't remember cute things your daughter did when she was six you may argue that there's a difference between because it is your own child, fair enough. Do you remember any funny work stories from 20 years ago? I'll assume not, but just because you're incapable doesn't mean that he is. How exactly are you defining associate? This definition is the linchpin of your argument, but also assumes you know the details of Scott and Tommy's relationship over two decades. I assume you have that info. Do tell! And again, what could Scott do to defend himself against the accusation that he's lied? I don't expect you to have an answer at this point. Like So when he wrote, how exactly are you defining associate? Well, the fact that... He's a developer for one of the games on the Amico. Shows he has a financial interest in the success of the console. And he also was the producer on several intelligent Amico videos. I'm not sure if it was only the Bomb Squad ones or other ones. He does have a vested interest because, like it or not, the Amico is so closely tied with Tommy Tallarico that any negativity that Tommy brings to light to the, the general public will impact people's opinions on the Amico, which then would affect sales. And less console sales equals less revenue, potential revenue from Bomb Squad. So that's why I say he has a vested interest and he's an associate, business associate. And from what I've read, they've been working together since Electric Playground days. So I'm not sure if they're friends or not off out of work, but they definitely have an association. So I replied saying, you're assuming his story is true and that he isn't fabricating and completely to help his friend out. When 99% of Tommy's stories have been proven to be lies and his friends also have covered and either lied themselves or went along with Tom's lies, why would anyone believe Scott is telling the truth? So this, once again, random Reddit person says, you're accusing someone of being a liar with no evidence, just your own assumptions. 
and I'm not going to read all the stuff here because this is ridiculous. So you can you can pause it and read the three things about having to prove someone's telling the truth or not. I did f find it funny at the bottom. He says, when Retro Bro took off his Tommy colored glasses, he said, I've discovered the Miko side is just as toxic as the anti side. I guess we could say it's true here that a few people want so much of their beliefs about Scott Baird to be true that all rational adult thought goes out the window. So it's really, really odd that a random Reddit f person is coming up to bat so much to defend the honor of Scott Baird. So it's not like that a lot of people are talking about Scott Baird and his name is being smeared similar to Tommy. I had just brought up the video and Scott said what he said and I just disagree with what he had said in saying that he was present and saying that Tommy is telling the truth. I just, my personal opinion based off of just logic is that it's not the truth and he's just covering for a friend. So it's very odd that a random Redditor would defend this guy's honor so much. Magically, I got a response from IHQ Devs who thanks Cloud Appropriate for defending my honor, his honor. And it, he reveals that this is who, that he is Scott Barrett and he's using this different account because he had doxed his original account. And I'll let you read this. You can pause it if you want to read everything because he does write a whole lot. Very similar to the Cloud Appropriate. A lot of very wordy. So basically what he had said is that Tommy is a narcissist and just because Tommy was in the room doesn't mean he created the oof sound but it also doesn't mean that he wasn't around when it was created. He also talks about how he likes H-Bomber guy's video and how extremely well done it was. Blah 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 because he's he just you can pause, like once again you can pause it and read all this stuff. So one thing I want to read out here is it says it's now been a year since we've talked. When he withdrew he did so just beyond the internet. Beyond just the internet. So I have no information about how he's taking any of this or if he's doing okay. Anytime I reach out, he has met with silence. And that's very interesting because Tommy's still the chief creative officer. Like he's still involved in one of the main, if not the main investor or for the for the ownership. And he hasn't talked with the Bomb Squad developer. And Bomb Squad was one of the few games that actually did get traction where people were interested in playing. It's one of the more interesting and unique experiences or games. So what is going on with Intelligent? That is very bizarre that we hear now a second developer who hasn't heard anything from Intelligent because last time was Mike Mika or Micah. So very, very interesting that this information was revealed. And so, I'll, like I said, you can read the rest yourself, but he says he's texted Joey, Joey Caress, and he doesn't want to get involved with anything. I don't blame Joey. And that he's also talked with the girl that was involved and that he recommended that she... Probably shouldn't, you know, unveil herself. And I also don't, I don't know, Scott makes a scene, like he says that this is like a big, huge mystery and that it's like uh, Bigfoot sightings and people want to know where did Oof came from. And I don't think really people give much of a care where the Oof came from. I think the bigger deal is the fact that Tommy Dalrico was trying to get a whole bunch of, like a big payday out of Roblox, even though he wasn't the one who actually created the sound. That's the that's the story. I don't think anyone really cares about how the sound originated. And getting back to the original comments, I just didn't think the story made sense. Like in my previous video, I had audio engineers say that they don't even remember what they recorded the week before. So why would people remember the specific sound from 20 years ago? That it's it's not significant. It's just one random sound effect. It just it doesn't make sense. So I had replied saying, once again, as a business partner, you would have something to gain if Tommy was proven to be correct and if somehow the overwhelming tidal wave of bad attention he attracted could be dissipated. On the same note, many folks are emotionally invested in the downfall of Tommy, so a lot of preconceived bias against him is also at play. As a Canadian myself, it is my duty to not lie, because that's what he said in the last thing. Therefore, I can simply call it based on history and logic. Also, I'm not invested in this financially or emotionally. I'm mostly attracted because of the train wreck aspect of it. The story seems far-fetched, as does every other story involving Tommy Tallarico, and Intelligent Miko seems to always be smoke and mirrors and nowhere normal at all. And then I said, at this point, I'm almost unsure if Scott Baird is a sentient AI and Bomb Squad was just some random AI-generated videos and that none of this is real at all. Well, maybe that was sarcasm, but you get the point. And I just wrote that just to be nice, because I don't have anything against Scott. Like, I thought the game was one of the, the decent, like, one of the few games that actually made sense on the system. And... I did get one more message after it. Holy jeez. The massive thing, once again, I'll let you read because I just, I can't. I just can't. And it says, Ninja, this is from Cloud Appropriate again. 
appreciate that you're responding to IHQ devs who basically said he doesn't give a shit about what you've said here in your video and hopes that I can remain a fan of yours, but that ain't happening. And so then he, this guy goes off again and he talks about how Scott develops really high. He gives a, a video link of Scott's previous game he worked on that had excellent reviews and just saying how Scott is a reliable guy, good guy. And once again, you can pause it, read it yourself. I'm just going to say, I thought this was a really weird in, encounter. I, I haven't had this because most people, most of the haters are the, not haters, most of the Amico fans who were not happy in my videos are pretty direct and just say, hey, I don't agree with you saying, or you are you suck or whatever. They don't write paragraph long or stories just to defend the honor of somebody else that's unrelated to them. So I'm assuming this was Scott with two different accounts because that's, once again, the only thing that makes sense to me. And I don't know. I don't know what to say. i sorry if I hurt his feelings and if he doesn't agree, but this is what happens when you get in... I'm not saying get in bed, but this is what happens when you associate with Tommy. Tommy stink rubs off on you. And that's why people distance themselves from Tommy because they don't want to get caught in the same bubble as him because Tommy has such a bad rep with everything that's happened that you will get lumped in with him. So not saying you can't defend a friend and, and maybe maybe Tommy was present during the oof thing. It just seems very not very logical. So I'd asked a few people and they said they said, Oh they think it's different people. I disagree. I think it's the same guy. So it was brought to my attention apparently somebody a year ago on the Ars Tetica forums, right around the time when Tommy was uh, threatening legal action or legal incoming to Sam Makovec and Ars Tetica because they published that article. On the forums, somebody by the name of IG Dev. Now, that seems very similar to what we uh, just saw a couple seconds ago with that other, uh, with Scott Barrett. And this person, we're not saying it's Scott, but who knows, has started posting very long, very similar, you know, novel like posts about. Not being pro Amico, but trying to be the devil's advocate and trying to push the Amico narrative so people weren't so one sided. And I thought it'd be interesting just to look at a couple of those posts. So his first one, and I'm not going to read everything because he posts, it's just like what I just showed you. There's so many long winded, winded posts that kept going into circles that it just make your head spin. So it's a very similar writing style, is all I'm saying. So his first post on the, the forums, and at that point on the forums, everyone was just like everywhere else saying, this is doomed, can't believe how terrible the Amico is, everything doesn't make sense, Tommy is crazy, all that stuff. He says, 10% facts plus 20% speculation plus 70% half-truths, aka 70% half-lies, is the composition of this article. It could have made the point in one-third of the words, I'm guessing there's a quota tied to article submission length to support the ads. I just googled Amico Kickstarter and Amico Crowdsource got zero hits. I dug some more and do see that they are on Republic, which is an investment vehicle, not really crowdsource, like the tagline would lead one to believe. Doctored photos? Not good, period. They would have done better to just get real people using the controllers for still photos. But this is Ars Tatica, not Ars Advertisica, so please stay with the tech angle, unless again, you have a word quota to hit. Kind of condescending there, kind of weird that someone who's a fan, like you're on the Ars Technica forums, why would you be trashing Ars Technica? Very bizarre. Why bash the controllers instead of the 8-way D-pad? There are 16 or something on the Amico, plus it supports rolling. Rolling seems like a good idea. My mom tried some stuff on the Xbox, tried to roll her thumb across the D-pad with bad effect. Maybe Amico has a good idea there. Why not call that out as an innovation instead of bashing it because it's not like everything else. Why focus on the negative Wii U side of things? I saw part of the E3 demo showing someone shaking dice on the controller and then virtually throwing the dice onto the TV. That seems like a cool idea. Why not mention the innovation like that? Doing a card game or football game picking receiver routes on your own controller seems like a good idea, actually. It looks like COVID-19 supply chain problems are hurting the startup much more than it would hurt the big three companies. Mostly because the startup is not as... is not he big... I guess you mean not as big as the three companies. They have to get their silicone from overseas like everyone else. Why wouldn't you mention that And when it's basically been in non-tech news for a very long time? 
I can make wild guess that a brand new controller takes 20 iterations and the factory turnaround is six weeks per and now 12 weeks per due to pandemic. That adds to the time. Then all of the other stuff that's not the controller seems like it would hurt a release date. Imagine that the demos are limited because no one can get the actual hardware. Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo have been impacted, we know. It's probably crushing this little company. Or crushing to this little company. A lockdown on patch support also means online multiplayer and Amico would be inherently difficult to support since online modes tend to expose issues like character balance and cheat exploits. This does not strike me as an online multiplayer console at all. The Amico promo stuff I saw talked about in-person games, not once about multiplayer online. Multi-online play. Why make a detracting comment in the article about something the console is not made to do? If the Amico makes phone class games instead of Xbox class games, and they are instant pick up and play on a TV for multiple people to enjoy, and they can get them to the 95 95% of the Earth's population that doesn't play or can't afford PS, Xbox, Switch, then they have a win. And if, you, as you can see at the bottom, it has a negative 36 for the you know plus or minuses on the actual post. A whole bunch of people commented. I'm not going to read out everything because that would take hours. But basically, lots of people were just saying, what the heck are you talking about? And pointed out all the tons of facts going against what he's just saying there. So this IG dev then says, I usually skim through the articles because the content is good. Stuff I didn't know. There's some stuff I didn't know on this particular topic. Then after reading through this one, it seemed to be so slanted with a lot of negative circular replies that I figured that I could chime in with a point of view that wasn't the same echo chamber. So here goes. I just created an account so I could write and not just read. If this was an old school call-in radio show, I'd say long time, first time. Anyways, here goes. It looks to me like the Switch has become a fairly complicated lift for an audience that wants to pick up and play. I think the scenario, I think the scenario the Amico addresses is the family is coming together for a barbecue. It's getting late. People are coming inside and it's time to play a game and two people pick up controllers and another four people pull out their phones and they all play something in front of the same TV and have the fun. The console is 250 and the game is $10. I don't know about the Switch economics, but wouldn't that be at a higher cost for a family to do a similar thing? This seems like the thing the Wii excelled at when it was new. The only game my family played on it was Wii Sports, super simple to learn, and stuff my mom actually tried it. It seems like the Miko's trying to do the same thing. The Switch seems to be more sophisticated. Another idea, what if the Miko's can go into bars and restaurants and stuff? Play a card game or snake game or something on a big screen against other people with your phone. <laughs> I had to stop there. <laughs> Why? Wouldn't it be easier to play a card game at the bar by just, you know, opening up a pack of playing cards? That just seems a lot easier in my opinion. Nobody will trash their own phone as a controller. Handing out a bunch of switches in a public setting like that might be asking for a lot of tech overhead as opposed to download this app and play. On some game with little to no instructions needed, I think that would be expensive and or complicated on a Switch. That one also got negative 9, negative 10. And uh, that's it. This seems very similar to the talking points that Tommy always had mentioned. And his name is IG Dev, and later on, he does admit he's a developer. So if he's at all in tune with the gaming industry, he would know the answers of how much a Switch costs and how you can buy third-party controllers. Just, uh, I, I, I could go in on this for so long, but I won't because there's so many more. This guy posts so many more things that were just long-winded. So we'll continue on with that. So he wrote, I thought they hired marketing people that used to work for Nintendo. I would expect them to know how to market this enough to make critical mass to sell them. I can't imagine they had to sell them at Xbox-like numbers to be successful. If there are 2 to 3 million consoles sold with n number of games that people like, I think that would make it a success. Having been on Windows forever, I can say it's easy to get lost in a sea of similar titles and never get recognition. The Amico idea reminds me of what the iPhone was when it first came out. It was a highly curated and limited library with a fixed set of design goals. If the television folks follow the same, maybe lightning can strike twice. Industry articles plus experts hated the iPhone idea in 2007. But back to the actual tech parts. It seems like we need to see more actual play from Intellivision. Until then, whether the Snapdragon can do it or not is the actual interesting stuff. The rest is just food for trolls. It would be cool if the article said, here's what we know from the leaks. And from my research on similar hardware shows, this. And if they use a name, another hardware platform, they could do that and etc. etc. Doing some creative extrapolation. That is what I want from Ars Technica. I can go on YouTube or Twitter if I just want to see negativity. Ooh. So I'll skip over what a bunch of other people, and he did say some more smaller things that's not worth mentioning, but 
Uh, as you can see on this screen here, it says, I'm imagining a family walking into a venue of some kind, big restaurant, and has a big screen monitor and TV attached. It seems like a barrier of entry of pretty low for the public venue to have a QR code for the Miko controller app, have staff with minimal tech skill to start the console, keep the console out of reach of the public, and maybe power cycling it for anyone who wants to play each time to keep it simple for busy staff and letting people play games that are supposed to supposed to not need serious instructions or a lot of USA culture knowledge to play. And I won't go through the rest of the points. You can pause it and read the screen here, but... That what an insane idea. He's so he's saying that restaurants would have the Amico people can play at the table. Why the hell would they do that? Because first of all, those controllers would get stolen. They don't. There's a million reasons why they wouldn't do this. It makes no sense. Most tables, most restaurants want to turn tables fast. They don't want people staying longer. They want people to come in, eat, leave. New people come in, eat, leave. They make more money. They don't want people lounging around. And if they did want something with lounging, they wouldn't have the Amico. They would have arcades or something else which is significantly easier and more and it's something they can actually generate revenue on so it sounds like this guy is using some pretty far-fetched ideas and if you notice the writing style just going into great detail so in this in this screen here somebody had rural ninja had said it's not me different ninja apparently that he's just talking about how why would developers want to be exclusive on the miko on a platform with such a small limited uh, audience and where they can, you know, go third party to different places and make more money. And IG Dev here says, if I am a developer with a pretty successful quick to play game on Android and need two months, three months of code base changes to run on the Miko, have to add tweak something so there is exclusive features on the platform. If I read the fine print correctly and I have access to 100,000 potential buyers, taking a swag that a million consoles sold will have 10% of it interested in a given game and net $5 per sell. That seems to be pretty good, especially if I have no platform competition because of curation. So if I can sell Finnegan Fox, but a competitor can sell Funnigan Fish, it seems like using the established older pick your descriptor Snapdragon platform in the gigantic Android dev base was a good move. You'll have to get the dev kits right and market the dev story, but this looks like extending the promise of the Unity and Android platform size matters. Maybe your implied point is that the intelligent has to increase the dev's percentage per game sold because the Amigo has to shine to attract devs. Seems like they should give it a give the first end devs like 90% in order to grow that game's list. Minus eight is what he got rated there. And then John Carter had said, this has been a very entertaining and informi informative discussion. I can't wait for the reappearance of Talarico. Oh, crossed out IG dev. And then he writes, more than one person can think that Miko could sell with all of us being Tommy Talarico. And uh, I don't think it's Tommy Talarico because Tommy would be swearing and calling Sam, calling out Sam directly and bitching on him nonstop. So after some banter between people, mostly people just crapping on and pointing, using all the facts to say that what he's saying was incorrect or just saying what he's saying is, you know, a pie in the sky idea. Sam Red, which is Sam from Ars Technica, says, you created this account only after this article went live. Named yourself IG Dev and have only replied to an otherwise dormant feature, arguably to bump it in the Ars Forum interface. Would you like to identify yourself at this point or at least clarify your relationship with the current incarnation of Intellivision? I ask this in particular because nobody has mentioned ADA friendliness until your latest topic bump. And Amico's lack of clear buttons on the top of its pad, only a touchscreen, isn't necessarily ideal for existing accessibility rigs that revolve around discrete buttons. If anything, the odd range of shoulder buttons make it such a rig even harder to firm up, so it's required bracing at multiple angles. You may have... You may very well be in a position to answer that concern on Intellivision's behalf, and if so, please go right ahead. So I guess what had happened is IG Dev was bumping the thread continuously trying to get people to respond and Sam had enough and just wanted to know, hey, who are you? So he had responded to Sam by saying, there's no Miko conspiracy going on. I'm not sure what you mean by bump up in the artist's interface, not looking for glory, just interested in some good debate on what can work on this thing or not. Like I posted before, I usually skim ours for the tactical infos when this topic went off the rails with something where I can think I can have some input. It seems like a good place time to get into it. Looks like trying to buck the group thing here was a mistake on my part. Anyways, I mentioned the controller because it seems like it'd be easier to handle compared to popular controller configs, and then list the three big ones, for someone on a special needs skill. I can't do anything on Intellivision's behalf any more than you can. There are lots of grades of ability, but my point is that something with less controls like a disc and a touchscreen and shoulder buttons could be easier to hand handle than something with small buttons on a tight layout. Special needs aside, it resembles the phone form factor and also could be, should be less intimidating for someone like my mom who didn't grow up with video games. 
And then he says, my username is variant mash of my name, not Intellivision game developer. If I worked for Intellivision, wouldn't that be the world's dumbest name to have on here to talk about an Intellivision article? You've made some good points about stuff. You can probably keep going without jumping to conspiracy theory. I guess on the restaurant, I, I'm not going to read the rest of the crap there, but Marcellus or Marcellus has says, on the contrary, it'd be a great name to use if, if one was to present themselves as an official representative of Intellivision and be able to talk about the console and the company from a position of authority and experience. For someone trying to hide their connection to an Intellivision, yes, it's the world's dumbest name. Regarding the rest of your posts, you're just arguing in circles. You're not addressing any of the actual concerns or issues others have brought up and just repeat how neat you think your ideas are. Damn everyone else for not seeing the same. It's not worth arguing with you anymore because you're not bringing anything, any thought or substance to in the discussion. And Sam had responded, then you don't skim the site as much as you allege because that's fine. And at this point, whoever you are, you're supposed to a lot about one topic and one topic only and have in time exhausted any sense that we might have expect reasonable debate, insight, or good faith acknowledgement of others' views on the topic going forward. I'm hopeful you redirect your energy at this point and I encourage you to, among other things, educate yourself on what accessibility in game controllers means. You can start with two pieces I wrote about a very good Xbox solution to the sector. Post two links and says take care. And from that point on, he disappears. He doesn't come back. So I'm sorry that this video has been long-winded and kind of boring. But I just thought, this is my opinion. Clearly, I don't have facts. Clearly, I don't have video evidence of this. But it appears that Scott Barrett is one of the guys that drank the Kool-Aid. So as in believing the hype of, oh, this is going to sell a million units. And I assume he's going on damage control, both in this Ars Tactica article, which is from a year ago. You know, trying to protect the Amico. And I also assume from like a week or two ago when I posted the video saying that, basically saying that I don't believe he's telling the truth about Tommy. So clearly something is going on. I assume he's just personally, like he took it to heart when I said that stuff. And I apologize if it upsets him. But that's based off everything I've read, seen, everything we've been exposed to. There's no reason at all we should believe anything. And I'm under the impression that this IG dev on the Ars Tactica thing is the same guy. And he's pretending to not be somebody associated with intelligence. So it is my opinion that possibly Scott might lie. So maybe he's also lying about the story of the oof. Just, you know, to defend his friend and former business associate, Tommy. It's not the end of the world. Like, I'm not going to say everyone should come after this guy and should be a witch hunter or anything like that. But just I just got to call it as it is. Maybe I am completely wrong. Write in the comments, people. Maybe I am just looking way too much into it, and it's just a weird coincidence that a guy named IG Dev writes long novels and talks in circles. So does IHQ Devs, and so does this other, whatever the hell the other guy's name on Reddit. They all have the same writing style, all really go in on defending something that really there's no, there's no point in defending. Maybe it's just me, but we'll start off with the more funny story that I don't think I've read anywhere. I thought this one was pretty funny, and it's a little excerpt from a book, and it's about uh, the guys who developed NHL Faceoff, and I'll just read off the book what it says here. It says, we decided to use an external person for a sound. Sony begrudgingly agreed. We hired a well-known sound guy named Tommy Tallarico. One of the many tasks Tommy was charged with was to record all the, of the public address announcer clips that were used in the game to announce goals, penalties, etc. This was a really involved process where every player's name and team names were recorded along with all the words and phrases a PA announcer might say. The voice of our PA announcer was a guy named Mike Carlucci. Mike was the announcer for the San Diego Gulls at the time, but had been the Anaheim Ducks and LA Dodgers announcer, among others, in his career. Sounds like normal business, right? A step in a wonderful direction, correct? Not so fast. Known for his work on a myriad of games from Batman, Return of the Joker, Disney's Aladdin, Oddworld, Out of the World, and Bard's Tale, Tallarico, the creator of the Video Games Live Concert series, attempted to put his own unique stamp on the game. Well, when all sanctioned recordings were completed, Tommy, who is quite the character, had some ideas of his own. Mind you, I was not at these recording sessions. Tommy had Mike do a bunch of takes of explicit versions of the things they had already recorded, Broadbooks said. Tommy thought it was this was hilarious and could possibly be an Easter egg. I guess, well, neither I or nor any of our staff knew about this. All the sound files, including the explicit ones, were delivered to us, and we had to provide a copy to Sony. So the Sony guys 
started going through them and came across all the explicit ones. Remember, I had no idea about these and we hadn't even listened to the delivered sounds yet. The next thing you know, I get a call from Kelly Ryan, the Sony executive producer for NHL Face Off 98. He was pissed. He spent 20 minutes yelling at me. All I could do is apologize profusely and explain that this was done without her knowledge. Kelly had good reason to be upset. NHL Face Off 98 was a licensed game with both the NHL license and the NHL Players Association license. Additionally, these games were rated E for everyone, so there was no way any of that explicit material could end up in the game. That was the first, and unfortunately, the last time Tommy Tallarico was used for the sound in NHL Face Off. I was a fan of Tommy and bummed about how things ended. Both he and his father are avid hockey fans, originally from New Jersey. I think Tommy's father had an impressive collection of hockey memorabilia. He was so generous that he gave me a signed Wayne Gretzky card and three Eric Lindros cards. I'm a big Flyers fan, and Lindros was the captain in the Flyers at the time. I'm not a sports memorabilia guy, but I still have those cards today. Aside from that, any an inadvertent behind-the-scenes subterfuge from Tallarico, NHL Faceoff 98 still played great and looked better than ever. So that's my first story. I don't think I've heard that story before, but what a what a re- unprofessional thing for Tommy Tallarico to do. What This is the same guy for the Amico who wanted E for everyone, the squeaky clean image. The CEO took it upon himself to do explicit and like why would why would they have explicit language in the PA announcements? Like this isn't the play by play. It it makes I'm guessing he thought this was funny, but just another thing that Tommy you know, a typical Tommy story where this doesn't seem like the uh, pinnacle of sound production for big time video game companies. Like that that's just this is the ninety eight, so this wasn't like earlier in his career. So that's the first story. The next one is uh we'll go with the, the saucy one. So this one comes from a book called Sex, Drugs, and Cartoon Violence, My Decade as a Video Game Journalist by Russ Pitts. And Tommy and Russ, I'm not gonna show a bunch of screens of how they're connected, but they've worked together and I believe they also coordinated to create a gaming expo. And this is what the story is from. So I'll just read the excerpt here. It says, the gathered journalists and I took turns wailing on the guitars. They're playing Guitar Hero. The New York Times reporter was there along with tips and tricks, Abby Hep, who eventually became community manager for Titanfall Respawn Entertainment and a few others. After an hour or so of plastic guitaring, the vast emptiness of the VGXPO hall began to crowd in on us, and the proceedings were moved upstairs to the hotel room of video game music star Tommy Tallarico. He was one of the creators of the concert series Video Games Live, and he was roped by Ed Fleming into judging the cosplay contest. Watching the contest earlier in the day, I had the distinct impression Tommy was bored out of his goddamn mind. He was hitting the sauce hard in his suite. I'll repeat that. He was hitting the sauce hard in his suite. We had a couple of videos. I think it was Goose... I'll put a link into the description where Tommy always bragged about he's never touched alcohol or drugs in his whole life. His own friend, this is not someone who hated Tommy, this is his former colleague writing about a story, says he was sitting the he was hitting the sauce hard in a suite. So there you go. Yet another lie from Mr. Tallarico. Unless his friend's lying, so who are we to believe? But anyways, the book says he was sitting hitting the sauce hard in a suite and trying to make the moves on a young woman who'd been hired to manage the land party. I couldn't tell if she was even 18, but I don't think Tommy cared. So once again, there's been lots of talks in the past. No evidence. I'm just just people saying this. It's not, I I have no proof of this. And a lot of times people were saying, suggesting that it's kind of weird that his wife was really young or ex-wife, I guess now. But his friend, word for word, wrote in his book, says, I couldn't tell if she was eight, even 18, but I don't think Tommy cared. Why would his friend say that unless Tommy likes the, the younger ladies? So, a little creepy there. Someone eventually broke a piece of furniture by sitting on it. That may have been me. <laughs> and the party broke apart as well. Each pair of feet out the door carrying a body who would rather have been anywhere else than VG, VGXPO and who was not looking forward to yet another day of the dismal event. And uh, I just thought I'd read that one out. It's This isn't like an Amico hater or anything. This book is from, I can't remember how many years ago, a few years back. Why would this guy write this? If Why would he make this up about his friends? So two things we learned. Tommy hitting the sauce hard, so he definitely drinks. And uh, trying to pick up a, a, a younger dame. So yeah, that's a bad look. 
And on this VGA, VGX Po, this is like a gaming expo, and there's, I read a few stories, there's nothing really, really, you know, juicy to, to show you guys, but there's something that Tommy had created, or helped been a part of the creation, and it was, a, it was like a colossal fa failure, so they rented out big halls, it would only get like 20 people, so I thought that was funny. And if anyone is doubting about this Russ Pitts being associate of Tommy, our friend, on the Video Games Live Facebook page, uh, Russ had mentioned about, uh, this is this four years ago, about uh, something about Video Games Live and Tommy responded, and they're both friends on Facebook, so th 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 this is definitely a legit source. So I found this other blurb in another book where it has Tommy with Ralph Bear. And the guy is just saying, what a nice guy. He's really the true father of video games, and it's a pleasure to meet him. He was kind enough to sign anything that folks gave him, and I regretted that I didn't think to obtain something that he invented to sign. I witnessed Tommy Talrico having a great time with Ralph, getting what appeared to be his entire Odyssey computer collection autographed. And you can see it's at a convention. There's photo evidence of him signing his equipment. So I was always under the impression that Tommy said that him and Ralph were dear old friends. And I, I could be wrong, so maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure in his older interviews he talked about Ralph coming to his house and that he signed that's where he signed all his Odyssey stuff and then gave him the, the original one of the original five instead of one of those replicas that everyone else is saying. So I'm beginning I would wager to bet that Ralph wasn't a dear friend of Tommy and Tommy has just brought his stuff to the convention and that's the extent of their relationship. I don't know. I just thought this would be funny to include just because there's a picture of him at a convention bringing all stuff to get signed just like a, a fanboy would. So Tommy's uh, reputation over the last while has been pretty hammered, like pretty pretty like destroyed, especially from the H-Bomber guy video. And I've noticed on Twitter people have been taking pot shots at him quite a bit lately and it's pretty funny and I found a few of them here and I'll show you them so Jeff Grubb and I highlighted he has 105,000 follow followers says Nintendo of America had uh, the original Metro Prime had been remastered for the Switch and he wrote congratulations to Tommy Tallarico on all his hard work to make this happen and somebody else had wrote Tommy Tallarico being dunked on will forever be funny so it's, everyone's taking cheap shots of how he ripped off everyone else and uh, another funny one is uh, Cow the Kangaroo, KO. And uh, it's, this is a slightly bigger than average indie game. And it says, so our Stadia planned release didn't quite go to plan. Neither did our Virtual Boy or Amstad CPC. But we think we've got it right this time. KO the Kangaroo is coming to the Intellivision Amico. And that was on their official Twitter. Now, that's from like March 7th. So it wasn't like April Fool's Day. And yet again, 15,000 views. I thought that was funny. So even like game companies are taking shots at Intelligent and Tommy. That, that was pretty good. I liked it. I believe this one is from the... I want to say this is from Octopath Traveler 2. And uh, a user by the name Kino Saga says, Tommy Talrico. And if you zoom in on it, it shows prisoner. And it says crimes, fraud, perjury, forgery. Notes, prisoner is delusional and a pathological liar. <laughs> so everyone... He's really taking a beating on uh, social media. So within the last uh, week or so, on Twitter, there was uh, quite a popular thread going on. And it's from Sonic Music Facts. And it shows Tommy Tallarico is credited for composing music for Sonic and the Black Knight. These songs are Molten Mine, Great Megalith, The Cauldron. However, there's evidence suggesting Tommy did not write these songs himself, instead taking credit for other people's work. And then it has Thread. And the classic picture of Tommy that he uses everywhere. But uh, I want to point out that 810,000 views on this thread, so so many eyes are <laughs> getting on Tommy and just his the bad things he's done, or misleading things, I guess. So it starts off with, according to a 2010 interview with Sonic Stadium, Yun Sanui, hopefully I pronounced that right, sound director for Sonic the Black Knight, said Tommy provided 10 compositions, of which Jun selected three, arranging two of them himself. And I'll read the little blurb here. It says, T-Bird says, wow, that'd be very cool for the Japanese audiences. I think one of the most impressive soundtracks from last year was Sonic and the Black Knight OST on the principle. It was 
so musically diverse. How do you go upon getting in touch with Tommy Tallarico? And what was it like working with him and Richard Jacques, amongst others? Yun says, talking about Sonic and the Black Knight, I ideally wanted to work with the guys who provided the songs for previous Sonic titles instead of teaming up with the second composers I usually team up with. I asked Richard Jacques, then spoke to Howard Drossen. Talking about Tommy, though, he was not an original Sonic composer. I've known him for years, and we are good friends. Oh, poor guy. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to team up with him and have him as a composer on this title. Tommy provided us with 10 ideas for tracks, and basically I selected three from his list. He composed one of them from the start to finish, and the other two tracks I used the ideas and took care of them, arranged them, and tracked the music with my band. It was a very fun experience. Sonic Music Facts says, The first song credited to Tommy on the soundtrack is Molten Mine. Tommy is credited for com composition music, while Yun is arranged the track. So you can see that uh, on the picture below. The composition is taken from a PS1 and Saturn game called Black Dawn, for which Tommy's studio, Tommy Tyler Eco Studios, provided the sound. And this is, this is where Tommy gets... This is where it's dirty. And so it says music by Tommy Tyler Eco. I guess it doesn't say created. He provided the music. But he didn't create the music. That's created by one of his staff members. So if you go to the original Black Dawn song, in the credits for Black Dawn, only Todd Dennis of Tom and Tally Rico Studios is credited, implying he did all the music, including the song that would be rearranged by Yun and Black Knight. And you can see the, the picture there talking about showing Todd Dennis. And I, I, I mentioned this before in a previous video, because Todd Dennis is really talented and has a different, totally different style of music. It's not the the burping, farting, Tommy Tallarico tacky music. It, like, he can actually put together music, and it's quite distinct. The next track is credited to Tommy is Great Megalith. This is one track Tommy provided that did not get rearranged before putting in the game. However, this song is taken from Black Dawn as well. It's exactly the same song. Tommy is credited for this track as well. So this shows music arrangement by Tommy Tallarico, programming Tommy Tallarico. Finally, The Cauldron. Unlike the other two songs, this one is not taken from Black Dawn. At least, it doesn't appear to be in the final game. So it's currently unknown if this track is taken from a previous Tommy Tallarico Studios project. So there's no concrete evidence against Tommy composing this particular song. However, the song does sound like Tom Tess's work on Black Dawn. And given Tommy's track record with the other songs, two other songs, it is a fair assumption that the ten tracks he provided to Yun were taken from his studio archives and not tracks by Tommy. And while this isn't really, you know, shocking news or anything, I think everyone was already were under the impression that he didn't write any of these songs. It's just I thought this was interesting because so many eyes saw this thread. So like the first part had eight hundred thousand views, and because this became popular, this thread, there's been two other guys on or females. I have no idea. Two other people on Twitter who started looking more into Tommy. And this is this is a good story. So there's two, actually, there's three different people. And I'll start off, and this was from the Brickster at the Brickster. So he says, "So I tried to give Tony Tallarico the benefit of the doubt and assumed he did at least did the Earthworm Gym all by himself. But then I came across this comment on H Bomber Guy's videos. Not even effing Earthworm Gym is safe. F in hell, Tommy. Why are you like this?" And so he posted a picture from the, the comment section, and it's from a, a Tony Berentick. And I'll read out what he wrote here in this comment section. And so this is on the H-Bomber Guy video. It says, Currently I'm working in the pit orchestra for the musical Oklahoma, and the French horn player turned me on to this video, the H-Bomber Guy video, when she found out I did music for Earthworm Jim 1 and 2. Yes, you read that right. I did two levels on Earthworm Jim 1 and all but two on Earthworm Jim 2. In the 80s, I had just earned my master's in music comp, plus a teaching credential from UCI, while my wife was a tax auditor for the state of California. She always had my reel with her, and while she was auditing Virgin Games in Irvine, where Tommy worked, she hunted him down and gave him my reel. At that time, Tommy was trying to create a banjo tune for Shiny Entertainment, the company that created Earthworm Jim. And I was playing piano at a 900-seat Western-themed dinner theater in Buena Park. At this theater, I worked with a well-known five-string banjoist, and I asked him to do tab some banjo rolls so I can add bluegrass banjo tune for my reel. The same reel that my wife handed to Tommy Tallarico. Musically, Tommy's possibly <laughs> this is good. 
Musically, Tommy is possibly one step above a garage band musician. He was absolutely clueless when it came to banjo. Anyway, he paid me a couple of hundred bucks for the banjo file and tasked me with more music for Earthworm Jim 2. I also did some work on Madden Football and a spot game for him. I'm guessing he's talking about Cool Spot. On Earthworm Jim 2, the mu- most of the music was mine, and years later I discovered that the other composer who created the music for Level 1 was Christopher Beck, who composed music for TV and movies. In California, if you do music for a living, you have to wear a lot of hats or you wind up eating your kids. So in addition to composing, I was teaching, grading compositions for MTAC, and performing and totally forgot about Talarico. About 20 years ago, my wife found a website with Talarico explaining how he created the banjo file. She read it to me and I cracked up. The guy was lying through his teeth. So judging from the video, he obviously has a problem with the truth. I'm one of the hardworking folks who he took credit for during his career. So how damning is that? So the, his big claim to fame, Earthworm Jim 1 and 2, it appears that Tony Berentek and this Chris, Christoph Beck did mo- almost all the music for the both games, like combined. And on top of Mark Miller, who's credited in the credits, like in the game's credits, did Tommy do absolutely anything in his biggest games? So I thought that was interesting. And uh, I... I think it was on the Intellivision underscore Amico subreddit, so you can look more into it. And they have links to the guy's LinkedIn. And clearly, like this guy has 50 years of you know, top-notch musical uh, education, experience, jobs. His portfolio is, is legit. And so the same with Christoph Beck. So it's looking like Tommy never ever did anything for Earthworm Jim aside pay other people to do it and then take credit because it's his studios so similar to the other games that we were talking about just before it's just this guy he likes to pay other people to do the work and then pretend that he does the work and then so technically he like he could say oh yeah it's from i did it as in i paid someone to do it so it came from me originally uh, not originally but it came from me eventually but oh this guy and if you go on goose's webpage or goose's youtube channel today he posts a great video of a live Earthworm Jim. I won't play the clip here, so I'll put the link in the description. Where there's four different performances over different years of Tommy playing the guitar to Earthworm Jim. And he overlapped all the four different things. And this may have originated from the Reset Era forums. They have a couple of good threads on Tommy Talrico and an Amico. So basically, it overlapped four different concert playings of the Earthworm Jim. And it's exactly the same. So clearly, it's just... Uh, like it's just being it's like a recording that's being played and he's not playing live and it's hilarious because it's all in sync the music and how he's moving his hands on the guitar is totally different in each different track so it's even further evidence that he doesn't play live he probably doesn't even know how to play the earthworm gym music at all so because of that sonic facts and the brickster we're getting more stories now so this is this is what i like so it keeps branching off in new stories so look jay and you can see this the person's Twitter account on the screen here, posted, this will be kind of unrelated, but the parade tune theme from Cool Spot is actually just the opening music from Monopoly Deluxe for DOS. And here's the context, and he has the link. And uh, I'll play the music side by side. There's no question that it is taken from the Monopoly game, which was made uh, from Virgin Studios. And if in the comment section of the YouTube video for the cool spot. It's Donald Griffin, the guy who composed it, wrote this himself. He says, this is the only tune in the game that I composed. Written originally for Monopoly Deluxe, Tommy Talrico liked it, so he put it into this game as well. So there you go. Yet another cool spot music where he talks about how he does stuff. It's just him using a different song from a different archive. But uh, I'll play the music now. Check it out. So if you do get a chance, maybe follow the Lobrickster. Also, this other Twitter user named Micah, and I'll show it on the screen here. They're also compiling and talking about what I've already covered, but in a different angle. And they're looking into some other 
Tommy, Tal- Tommy Talrico tunes to see if they're ripoffs. So check out that uh, Twitter user also. They had some interesting uh, discussions about uh, Todd Dennis. So we have even yet another one, another story from Grant Harper, the emotional guy, and his Twitter is on there too. It says, speaking of which, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think the PCB Productions founder Keith Aram did most of the music to the Demolition Man 3DO game. Tyler Rico only composed one track for the game, Wasteland, and Charlie Malone probably only did the opening logos track. So they have the credit there. And we don't have any evidence in this, so this is just someone else's theory, but it looks like even for the Demolition Man game, Tommy really did quite little, and that Keith Aram was the guy who did most of the work. So the H Bomber Guy video still has a ton of more new comms being added. And I pulled a few from a little while ago, like I think a few weeks or a month ago, and I stopped doing it because there's just so many, so many comms to go through. And, but there's a couple of juicy ones, and uh, might have to go back because there's even more stories coming out every day. But this one is from David Thiel, and it says, You have to remember that back in the day, game companies wanted to keep their talent anonymous. After Warren, Jeff, and I created Qbert, so I guess he's an old-time programmer there, we were interviewed by game magazines. Gottlieb, owned by Columbia Pictures at the time, insisted that we use pseudonyms instead of our real names. Warren was designer, Jeff was artiste, and I was Jay Walkman. There were no credits on the game at the time. I was DDT in the default high score table. This, itch, this situation fueled my dissatisfaction with my employee status, and I left after 12 months, 12 months later. And trust me. There is very little that a musician could do for a video game in the period of 1975 to 80. The technical technology was marginally there. Most of the cutting edge sound was in Japan and Chicago, pinball. More evidence that Mr. T is telling porkies. <laughs> I'm guessing porkies means lies. And I'm guessing he's talking references to the old bloops and bleeps and how he revolutionized stuff. I don't know. I just thought that was funny that he said the word porkies. Jal Kum. 4201 says, by the way, about his China concert, Chinese streaming sites have inflated view counts. It's clicks, not really views, as far as I know. What matters is that they never represent actual viewing counts as we are used to, I'm guessing talking about here in North America. And I had tried looking up, and clearly, since I can't read Cantonese, Mandarin, or anything, can't really get too far going on Chinese web pages, but I did notice on a few of their equivalent YouTube sites that the view counts are all over the place and uh, just like random videos that are of nothing would have tens of thousands of views so I don't doubt that his claims of all the streaming people streaming is dubious Black Pajama 6600 says Tommy is the worst kind of video gamer the kind that reinforces negative stereotypes of video gamers for anyone over the age of 21 the image of a gamer we remember from television commercials and news stories and popular media in the 90s and aughts the period during which gaming arguably entered the mainstream was a cocky teenager with too much tood and barely any respect for the dweebs he consistently pwned in the arcade street fighter tournaments this is tommy's core identity it seems someone who wants to be seen as a, being associated with video games even if they're merely peacocking and that's dead on that's 100 percent accurate he is the <laughs> he is the old stereotype and even in his interviews and when he talked about when he's in high school and how the, everyone thought he's the coolest guy in the gang he's uh even in the late 90s, that type of image was was not, uh, it's kind of fading away. And he, especially in Electric Playground, he really hammed it up and reinforced that stereotype. Getting back to this, it says, It strikes me odd that we have so little video documentation of Tommy actually, well, gaming. And in the clips we do have, he always seems like he's wrestling with the game itself. Hence the gripes of controls and such in his reviews. When I watch the screen of a game... Tommy's playing, they never look like the screens of a dedicated gamer. Purposeful movement, direct engagement, constant feedback. They look like the screens from when my dad used to play Medal of Honor with me as a kid. Jerky movements, aimless wandering, and complaints about the most minor of issues. This is all speculation, of course. Maybe Tommy Tallarico is the master of master gamer of ancient legend. But what serious video gamer, much less video game developer, boasts about having worked hand-in-hand with Shigeru Miyamoto one of the godfathers of the industry when anyone who knows who Miyamoto is also knows that he had never worked so intimately with someone like Tommy Tallarico. And, uh, well, 
that's just Tommy trying to pretend he knows someone famous, and that's Tommy being Tommy. But his previous comment about Tommy not being a real gamer is, uh, I believe that, because in his house tour video, he talks about the game system he plays is his old Intellivision. And he has all all the stuff in his house, all this junk, but he plays the Intellivision. He also had a main arcade, but I, I don't believe he, uh, I don't believe he is an actual gamer, so... And Full Moon October must have visited his webpage because she said, I just noticed in the Photoshop celebrity section that his neck looks all kinds of wrong. I can't stop laughing at it. He can't even edit himself next to famous people, right? And we'll have to take a look at that at some time. But I wouldn't doubt it. Josiah the Bone says, I've actually worked on one of these video games live shows. It was not live. And this gets back to what I showed earlier. The orchestra was brought together with minimal forces. Lots of parts were missing. We actually played along with an audio track. It was incredibly bizarre, as I had gone to see the show about 10 years prior, and they played full of, with full orchestral forces. I also have to say that Talarico and the show were touring with some generally fantastic musicians who were wonderful to work with, but Talarico was the center of attention throughout the show. It's really sad to see someone who genuinely has a lot of things to be proud of feel that they need to inflate themselves in their legacy so much. And then we have Xanthan again saying, and there's always a question if those in the pit were paid for their hard time or even travel expenses. Josiah says, we were, I can confirm that at least. And we've heard stories and in previous videos. If you watch my previous videos, you have uh, the Twitter post of the, the lady who's saying. And a little bit later on here, I will go over Martin Leung, the video game pianist. Not the penis, but the pianist. <laughs> and his falling out with Tommy. I'll do that after. Darcy Halen says, imagine being on a video call with a guy in a $3 knockoff Dr. Doom mask. And you're the more cringy person? Effing hell. And the reason I'm not swearing is because my kid's in the other room. Try not to swear. But, uh, yeah. Poor poor Mad Max. He's, he's had a rough little while there. And uh, that's what you get for going online. If, if you're not, if you're going to go and do streams, instead of wearing a Dr. Doom mask, just, just do what I do. Just put something else on the screen. HR C typo. 42 says, to add to the point about Guinness Records of Gaming, I was actually included in the 2016 version of the book without even being notified or consulted. It's listed under Longest Home Run in Super Smash Bros. Melee. The kicker is that the higher scores have been achieved using other characters in the game, dating all the way back to within a year of the game's release in 2001. The listing has several other inaccuracies and vague turns of phrase that could have been avoided if the person who created this entry had asked me or even done a cursory look at the video's at the videos that they show up when you Google the game mode. I didn't even know it was possible to get a plaque. So there you go. So this guy was in the book itself. Didn't get a plaque. They didn't contact them. So it looks like they just go online, Google search, and just throw something to fill out a book. So can't always... Uh, Guinness records... Uh, don't take that as uh, legit all the time, I guess. Greg Bonks. I like the name. When he explains how to create a sound effect at 3642, this is an H Bomber Guy video, I'm just going to put this bluntly. No one says, we start to tweak the sound each individual sound. You remember what sections of the EQ bands you use. If you use a compressor, things like that. I'm no professional, but I've worked with a lot of people who work in audio engineering. None of them describe their process like that. It hurts to watch Tommy lie that poorly. It's embarrassing how little he knows about it. And that's, this is a good post. And I really hope someone does... It'd be great to get an audio engineer or someone who's worked in the gaming industry to analyze what Tommy has said. It just uh, because, as a like, I'm not a musician, so I can't comment on any of that stuff. But it would be here interesting to hear an expert break it down and most likely show that he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Retro Music Dan says this was sobering for me as a teenager wanting to get into video games music for a career. This guy popped up everywhere. I have books which provided me with contact, contract templates supposedly provided by him. It's always Joey, lol. And just getting back to that, just before I continue, when I was looking through Google Books to see what Tommy has been in, he has a lot of, there's not lots, like five books where they talk about, where he's just talking about how to get your music, you know, how to get IPs of your own music and how to get the developer or gaming studios to give you ownership of it so then you can charge them later or reuse it at a later time so this this makes sense and i did see the contract templates i won't show them here they're extremely extremely rudimentary like this is 
it's pretty it's pretty bad like maybe because it's from 1995 or 6 but it, it's I'm not even a lawyer but it, it looked pretty poor anyways getting back to this it says I went to video games live twice owned three of the albums and backed one on car- Kickstarter there are interviews full of American dream lies on at least one of those CDs I don't know what he means by that but we'll continue on back in the day Martin Leung the original blindfold video game pianist tried to call him out for miming his guitar playing in VGL I refused to see what was in plain sight it might be relatively small, but I can, can't tell you how disappointed I am. I'm grateful to you and your team for this. This cultish individual rock star culture is awful, and I don't want others to be duped the way I was and have to feel like this. So getting back to the video game pianist, and he's like he's probably one of the main reasons why the show became big. Because I remember like early in YouTube, lots of sites were linking to him because he had the blindfold on and was playing all the Mario, Zelda tunes, and everything. And he's really good. Like He's... Like, ace, like, expert level. And I had heard rumors that there was a falling out between him and Tommy. Mostly that Tommy uh, basically is using the guy and not paying him <laughs> properly. Just like um, the previous video with the, the the flutist that I had shown. And I tried finding this stuff online. I could not find it. If someone else can find... Because Martin had posted a bunch of stuff on Facebook. I could, it's all deleted now. And there's some message boards that reference it, basically saying what this guy said here that Tommy Talrico is a hack. He plays nothing live. And Martin, if you look up, to, if you look into him now, like he has a, he's like a doctor now of piano studies, and he's ridiculously good, like true musician, like no doubts about it. And uh, I can't find anything online, any of the quotes. I'd love to find it. So if anyone has them, but the the gist of it and. What everyone talks about is this basically he was the main part of the show. He's on the DVDs, and then there's a falling out. He he talk, talks about how Tommy doesn't play music, and then Tommy sn- snapped back online, just like you know how he does with the intelligent amico stuff. None of it's online anymore, so I wish I could find it. But uh, I did find like an old post here that says, "Hey Tommy, recently video game pianist Martin Leung." Kind of turned on VGL over on his Facebook page, and despite your attempts to talk to him there, he seemed to ignore you. You also mentioned that you tried to contact him personally, but nothing. Did anything ever come of this? This, just the context, this I think came from his Reddit AMA. Big fans of both of you see, strange to see him take a strange, that was sad. Tommy responds, nope. This is from 2013. He refused to contact me and speak like adults. I feel he is very capitalized underappreciated of me and VGL considering all the opportunities and audience that we helped him to receive it's a shame he put out all that garbage most of which he has since deleted a day after our Kickstarter launch I think the timing was a little too suspect from what I could tell and from what people have written to me he lost some fans because of the way he handled himself it kind of reminded me of the time he ranted all about Lang Lang in my opinion it's unprofessional when musicians talk that way publicly about other artists composers musicians kind of sounds like those people are jealous but a guy like martin never needs to be jealous of anyone considering he's such a talented young man i wish him well on his journey i really do but he definitely won't be performing with us ever again And because of that of the way he handled himself the things he said to personally hurt me my hard work and the show how he refuses to speak with me i no longer consider him a friend he no longer considers him an amico we all know what Tommy is really like and his condescending personality. And if you watch the his private message to uh, video for Pat and Ian, he's extremely condescending and trying to be the bigger guy but taking pot shots. And I I, I, consi- I see what this is exactly how he how he is. And I don't know Martin personally. But not trying to follow stereotypes, but usually Asian piano players not the most. Uh, aggressive and con- you know confrontational type folks and he's a pretty humble guy based off how he portrays himself to public there's lots of videos of martin online tommy he portrays himself as an uh, as, as a jerk so i'm going to side with martin here and uh what my my opinion or my thoughts my guess would be martin is probably tired of getting used similar to the female flutist and being a main player of the show, like that's people want to see live music. And either Tommy wasn't going to pay him, probably not going to pay him for royalties for the Kickstarter, because even though it features him in it, Martin 
probably wasn't too happy about that and Tommy of course can't handle the truth so when Martin starts speaking the truth and talking about how his hard work Tommy's hard work of him air guitaring <laughs> it uh that's uh that's probably what ended up happening so good job Tommy Vixen505 says, All right, so after the fact checking with old friends, my class actually play tested the Miko console demo a while back. My interview never got uploaded to the YouTube channel, but my classmates did. I think it was because I had literally nothing to say about it. It really wasn't anything special. I met Tommy and thought he was cool, but kind of strange. No idea who he was at the time. I just tried to enjoy the game. I remember one of the controllers didn't work, so we had to take turns. We played Shark Shark game and that had to be instructed on what to do. I completely forgot the game, the name because I was just focused on being interviewed. LOL. I always wondered what happened with the console. Absolutely insane that it turned out to be an entire mess. Hmm, there you go. I'd never heard about a class testing out, so maybe uh, more people from the class can, uh, can talk about their experiences. And when I was looking for old uh, Tommy Talrico things uh, from the ex from that previ previous one, it says, Pooba says, Sure, he makes decent music, but in real life, he's a patronizing wanker. I love that word. Maybe if you're a lackey, he's friendly to you, but I met him at a nerd con back in Australia. He was doing a signing for Video Games Live Tour, and I walked up and said hello and asked if he was Tommy Talrico. He turned to his hanger-ons and dramatically, Oh no, he's not here yet, man. Cue simple toady laughter. Gee, sorry for not ever seeing any of your shitty TV shows, Tommy. How stupid for me for not knowing what you look like. That's from 2007. I thought that was funny. So that's all I have for today's video. Uh, it's a lot. It was a bit longer than I thought it'd be. Sorry about that. It's sorry if it bored you guys, but let me know if you want more Amico videos. I have a couple ideas, not the normal stuff that everyone else has been doing, because I've noticed, and I do appreciate it though, like on the Discord and also the Intellivision underscore Amico subreddit. There's a lot of like a lot of action, but uh, there's quite a bit of people rehashing stuff that's been talked to death already. I do have a few different ideas, but to let me know, leave comments. Maybe like, do you want different Amico videos making fun of the shills, different takes on what has happened? I don't know. Let me know. Hit subscribe because uh, that, I'm supposed to say that. I don't know. And uh, I do have other video ideas in the future. And no, I'm not gonna just copy everyone else do DK oldies. I do have different opinions in them, and same with like limited run and stuff. So maybe I'll have some when I have a bit more free time. There'll be more videos in the future. But until then, have a good one, and I'll see you in the next video.